This conference will now be recorded. So I want to welcome everybody to the ANCAN Advanced Cancer Dis uh, Support Group. It is um, Monday, May 16th, 2022. And I'm Herb Geller, fresh back from a trip to New Orleans. So uh, maybe the alcohol has worn off so I can concentrate on the meeting tonight. And we have several, two, at least two new people that I'd like to get to introduce to the group. And then we, we, I will move on to those of us who have asked for time. And so, Bruce, let, can we start with you? Hub, Hub, let, okay. let's, sure. just tell, let's just tell the new people that we do record these meetings. Okay. Um, and, um, we do it for a couple of reasons. One is because a lot of people like to go back and listen to them again. And um, uh, another is because there are people that can't make it and rely on the um, on the recording. And so um, if you prefer not to be identified on the recording, you can let us know beforehand or during. Um, we, we fully understand and, and we'll find a way to work with you. So go ahead. Okay, thank you for doing that, Rick. So, Bruce, are you there? Yes. So, yes, I am. And your last name is Gapman. Gapman. Okay. Yep. And how old are you? Seventy-three. Seventy-three. And where do you live? Honolulu. Oh, okay. Another Hawaiian. And when were you first diagnosed? Well, we'll say February 1st was the, I had an ultra scan of the doc was suspicious at that time. Okay. And then what happened after that? I got an MRI and a bone scan. Uh, MRI revealed, you know, confirmed the prostate cancer and cancer and lymph nodes and the helium. Okay. Well, the bone scan did the helium, but the... Uh, right. Now, did they do right. a biopsy of your prostate? Uh, they did using the uh, TERP method because the suspicious nodule was very close to the urinary tract. Uh-huh. And so when they did that biopsy, did they send it out for pathology did you get a pathology report I, yeah i got a i did get pathology and gleason score 10. gleason 10 okay and what was your psa at the time well the last psa i had was in february at 12.5 12.5 in february and you haven't had a psa since that time no my next one will be uh, early July, I think. Okay. And w so who's treating you? Uh, Aloha Urology, a fellow named Dr. Alex Belshoff. Now, this past Tuesday, I got my first uh, Lupron injection. And got, so did they give you any other injection before they gave you Lupron? Did you have any other treatment? No. No. Uh, so in addition to that, he's prescribed uh, apalutamide pills, mm -hmm. which have just finished the approval process, and I plan to start those soon. Okay. So did they find, now did you, did, how, you've been seeing this doctor since February, did they do any uh, genetics on your, on either you or your, or your cancer? Not that, no. Not that I know of. No. Okay. So no genetic studies yet. No. And uh, so how did you find out about ANCAN? I was just looking online for support groups and okay. looked like a good one. So there we are. Okay, well, we're here. We're definitely here to support you. And then I guess the question now 
would be before we turn it over to sort of the group to get to know you better, uh, what questions do you think you might have for us? Well, it's more, you know, what should I anticipate? The doc says he thinks I'll be on a lifetime of injections and apalutamide, but it would be well managed and I can be mostly normal life, but uh, just like to learn about experiences of other people. So I take it, so how this was simply picked up just because how it was, as you said, it was, it was picked up on a scan? Yeah, an ultra scan was the first. Well, I had some symptoms of urinary discomfort, which okay. led to the ultra scan, which you know started the whole chain rolling here. Okay, so I think we have a, a pretty good picture of where you are. You're newly diagnosed. Your PSA in February was 12.5. You've had Lupron, and I guess I'm going to turn the ask. The discussion. I'm going to ask Peter, as a fellow Hawaiian, to sort of introduce more and maybe ask some questions. Hi, Bruce. I'm I'm over in Maui. Uh, oh, okay. Dealing with this for eight years. Uh, I help guys on Maui, and I've been involved. I run, you know, I help run this group too. You know. Uh, oh, nice. Yeah. There's not a. I mean. First of all, one of the first things that's going to come out in the discussion with the group is that in Hawaii, we're kind of a little bit crippled because in, for advanced disease, there are no medical oncologists that specialize in prostate cancer. So in my situation, I made a beeline for California when I was first diagnosed, and I, my medical oncologist has been there ever since. I, I use a local guy from Straub. For, uh, when I did chemo here, but with, with a Gleason pen and symptoms and what you got going, you're going to probably want to get the best help you can get. And you're not going to find that in the islands. So um, just giving you a heads up about that. Are you, are you a vet here or, or long-time resident in the islands? I've, yeah, I've lived here since 78. Okay, it's a long time. And, and you're being treated by an oncologist or a, or a urologist over there? Well, initially it's a urologist. I've got a referral to a radiation oncologist just to get his take on the situation. Okay. Well, so I, I see think, that fellow yeah. in July. Yeah. yeah well, we're, we're kind of behind the times here. They just, a couple, three weeks ago, they started doing PSMA scans here. And, um, and I'm not of the gallium kit, but I'm, I'm not sure they're up to speed yet on it. And that there's just a, a lot of the holes in the, um, in the treatment uh, scheme of things here in the islands. Um, and I guess my question is, are you flexible enough if you needed to travel to, uh, to make contact with a, uh, if you need a urinary medical oncologist, if you had to go to California or, or, or someplace Peter, I, th I think there's a bigger issue here that, that we should really be discussing with Bruce. Um, I think, you know, we, we have to tell you, Bruce, that um, a five plus five is serious business. You probably right. know that already. And the way that your urologist is treating you um, leaves some question marks open. Um, Herb asked you if you had had any pills prior to the first shot that you got. Um, when a man has metastatic disease and he gets a uh, shot like you did, um, the the standard protocol, to be honest, is is to is to give you some sort of protection first depending on the type of shot that you got. Do you know what type of shot that first shot was? Was it was it Lupron or? or it was Lupron. Lupron. He did say it was Lupron. Lupron. So if it was Lupron, what the urologist did was dangerous. 
And I, you know, there isn't a lot we can do right now, although you could call him up since you only just got it. You might call him up tomorrow and say, I would like to take some bicalutamide immediately. We can put that in, oh, you, you're on the telephone, bicalutamide or Casadex, C-A-S-O-D-E-X. The reason they should give that is because it protects you and it protects parts of your body that could possibly be compromised. And what concerns me when I hear this is that um, these doctors are not fit to be treating people with advanced disease. There's a whole bunch of other things that really should be done. You should be getting something called an axiomin scan because we need to know how many spots there are, how many, the MRI alone is not sufficient. So ideally you would get this new fangled PSMA scan, which has just come to the island, but we know you can get an axiomin scan on the island. I don't think and you can. I don't think you can yet. Only this galley. I would, well, we could, we can find out by calling Blue Earth. But, right, but, but I, the, the, you know, the point is that without this information, we don't, they don't know how to treat you and to put you onto apalutamide um, without that knowledge is questionable. The other question is, is, is there any reason why you cannot take steroids? Mm -hmm. uh, not that I know of. So then we would be asking, why is he giving you apalutamide first instead of abiraterone, which is a comparable drug but requires steroids, which is probably a better first drug to give. So there's a whole lot of questions. So I guess Actually, what we're saying to you is, you know, for your own sake and, 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 and the, to keep you around for a long time, um, we'd encourage you to be thinking about getting um, some better care because yeah, this I guy mean, doesn't sound like he's on the ball. Let, let me pick up a little bit with what Rick said. The other thing that I, and I mentioned is specifically about genetic testing. Uh, you can, you need to do, there are two kinds of genetic testing done for cancer patients, for prostate cancer. One is your germline. Do you have any mutations in your germline that could affect the prognosis or indicate paths for treatment? And Explain the second, germline, Herb. Explain what? germline. Germline means your DNA. It's what you were born with, okay? So that germline testing is looking at your DNA. The second type of testing that is recommended, and this is in the NCCN guidelines, or, for anybody, and especially with advanced disease, is testing the cancer itself, whether there are genetic mutations, and those are called somatic mutations, both of which, again, either one can provide incredibly useful information in terms of, in terms of treatment strategies. And, and the fact that you, you didn't do it, it isn't automatic, I guess makes me even question even more the kind of care you're getting. So, I mean, I think if it were, as, as a Gleason 10 myself, I would say that the only path is to find yourself a GU oncologist. And, and if, if it requires uh, a trip to the mainland, uh, I think you'd be well served to do it. I mean, okay, just, so. I mean, although I will say one thing, Rick, I did finally, I did sit through one presentation at AUA and it was from the apalutamide folks who did show some really pretty good survival data uh, with treatment with apalutamide. So that, yeah, but, that but we know that, but we also know that, that, that abiraterone preceding one of the, uh, one of the IDES seems to do better than one of the IDES preceding apalutamide. Yeah, I agree. Right. So, I mean, but I think we've got to we've got to explain to Bruce what we're saying because we're talking in terms he doesn't understand. Right. A GU, a GU me medical oncologist is a is a medical oncologist who specialises in prostate cancer. Unfortunately, that doesn't exist 
on the island of Hawaii. Peter's telling me that he just spoke to Blue Earth who make the Axiomin scan, which is not as good as the PSMA scan. And apparently it isn't available. But to be honest, it's really important that you get a scan like that. Because if you have more than five spots, more than four identifiable spots, then the question is whether you even start with apalutamide. And that can make a huge, huge difference to your outcome, Bruce. So whilst we don't want to scare you, we want to make sure you're getting the right treatment because this could make the difference um, between successful treatment and unsuccessful treatment. So, um, you know, we can only tell you what the guidelines are and what the protocols are, and your guy isn't really following them right now, or he's not even giving you the option to right. follow. The, and the other, I, let me say, in a, I want to follow up with Rick. You have systemic disease. You said so, it was in your lymph nodes in your bone. A urologist is a surgeon focusing on urological issues. They are not trained or experienced in dealing with systemic disease. And they can't be because they're too busy with other things. So we would, at least our general consensus in this group is that when you have systemic disease, you need a specialist in prost prostate systemic disease and their title is called a GU medical oncologist. Okay, maybe I can get a reference from Peter. I think Peter can give you a reference. There must be, there are several on the West Coast that we trust. So Bruce, Bruce, my email is Peter K, Peter K at ancan.org. If you send me an email, I'll, uh, I'll give you my phone number and we, I could give you some ideas after, after the meeting. Doctors you might want to check in places that might be convenient. So, so it's Peter, just K, the letter K. Peter, letter K at ancan.org, A-N-C-A-N.org. Got it. And I think, I mean, if you guys get together, I think you'll get some really first-rate advice from Peter. But I think, I, I, I think all of. I, let, let me ask: Are there any other anybody else would like to make a comment? Len, I'd like to you. I'd like to hear what you think. Well, yeah, I was just thinking that it seems that the new standard of care for someone like Bruce is actually triple therapy, uh, you know, de novo hormone sensitive prostate cancer, high risk is um, uh, Lupron or some first line antiandrogen, a second line antiandrogen and uh, uh, docetaxel. So that's probably what he should be getting I think I believe that's considered to be the new standard of care, even if it hasn't yet been written into the NCCN guidelines. I mean, I think it it is, and I think it's also a function of how many, you know, what's the extent of the disease on imaging. But, but Bruce, you have not had the appropriate imaging yet. Okay, that uh, like Peter was saying, we do newly have available here PMSA. Well, I mean, I'm look. Okay, I would like everybody, by the way, for those who are new, please use. We have a chat window going, and there is useful information when you click click on the chat button in the upper right hand corner of the window. And one of the things that Peter has put in the chat window is that the Gallium 68 just came to Hawaii, but Hawaii, but it's not up and running yet. But it is up and running. But there's questions about who's reading it and whether the radiologists are, are yeah, really but, up to speed. Peter, that, that's, that's, not, that's not bona fide because, because what Lanthius has done is provided software so that anybody can get a standard reading. Now, you don't have the experienced people to read it. We know this, but that's no different from somewhere in the middle of the country here. So what they've done, and this is FDA approved, is they, 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 they have a software package. And that software package comes with 
um, the the uh, with the pilarify. So they can read it based on the pilarify. And if they're telling you they can't, there's something wrong. Well, I'm just telling you, my oncologist last week when I talked to him about it, he was kind of rolling his eyes, you know, saying well, yes. Well, maybe he wonders yeah. about it right now. He, he yeah, said it wasn't even, quite up to speed. Peter, maybe he's not aware of the the artificial intelligence. Okay, could be. I mean, yeah. He may not be aware that there's AI. At the very worst, these there ought to be a way for Lantheus to point to send the image to somebody who can interpret it. Right. Well, the guys, we're, to we're going down. Why. We're going down a rabbit hole here. We don't need yes. to do that. Right. There is AI. Well, I, I think basically, okay. Peter, you can talk to Bruce. And I think Bruce, you really listen carefully, because I think it can make a big difference in the way you get treated, and potentially. I appreciate all this. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Right. Now here's a way to get a free DNA test. Uh, Promise gives free DNA tests to people with prostate cancer. Go to prostatecancerpromise.org. Do not say you will give uh, blood or tissue, they will send you a spit tube, you spit in it, they will have a, 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 a specialist work with you about what the results are, and it's free. So uh, prostatecancerpromise.org, and you should log, go in there today, sign up, you'll have the thing within a week, and you can then find out what your genetics look like as far as prostate cancer is concerned. The geneticist. A geneticist will talk with you. Right. So let, let's be clear that that is only for the inherited. Let's be clear that's only for the inherited. We've got to be careful how we explain these things, Jeff. So that is only part, that, that's only part of what Bruce needs to do. So do you have any cancer in your family, Bruce? Uh, yes. I've got uh, got a sister died of ovarian cancer. Another sister who had both ovarian and breast cancer, but has uh -huh. had surgery uh -huh. and is doing well. Well, well, that would indicate strongly that a genetic test of your DNA would be a really useful piece of information to see you have any gene mutations that could lead to cancer. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the thing is that, that, that these are questions the doc should be asking. And when you tell him that history, that throws up all kinds of red flags. So the, the test that Jeff Marchi suggested is really important. And you can get that free, as he said. Peter can help you find that when you, when you, um, when you send Peter an email and and he has your email, we can, we can show you how to get that free test very easily. But you probably need more than that. And, and you know, that you might even be a good candidate for um, um, some, more, some more testing right now. Um, but, you know, this is, there's a lot that we need to do. The other thing that we haven't talked to you about is that um, Typically now, um, men will get their prostate treated even if they are diagnosed metastatic. And I suspect um, that hasn't been discussed yet, although that might be what the um, doc has in mind when he sends you over to the radiation oncologist in July. But July is a long way off. Yeah. And, and, this and you May. know, this is May and, 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 and testing three months intervals is a long way off i mean yeah you know these guys are not on the ball and when i was when i was first diagnosed bruce i was tested at three week intervals mm -hmm. the idea that you've been going since february and you don't have another psa test we don't know what's happening yeah i was curious about that myself i said shouldn't i get a pmsa test before the first lupron test and Yes. I mean, first Lupron injection, and uh, anyway, they're going to test me. So I got a like a 30-day Lupron injection, then a next will be a 90. Right. And then the other question I asked Bruce did before they gave you the Lupron, did they measure your serum testosterone? 
Well, not that I know of. Because that's the way you know if it's working. Guys, the bumper well, stickers here say that this ain't the mainland. Huh? That's what the bumper stickers say. This ain't the mainland. You know, we have right. We have some archaic medicine here. Bruce and I will talk, and I'll give him. Okay, some great. Peter. So I think I think we will move on, and I think. Sure. We'll, yeah, I appreciate we'll everything, and uh, I'll be and, in touch with Peter. You know, and we meet weekly, so please come back and keep us informed about how things are going. Okay. I sure will. I appreciate everything. Okay, so we will move on, and we want to introduce our uh, next uh, new attendee, Ori Near. So, Ori, uh, are you with us? Yes, I am. Thanks. Uh, I'm not sure if you see me. My camera. I'm not I sure think, it's no, on. Your, no, you can. Is your you, you is your camera on? I turned it on. Yes. Um, oh. Try again. Okay, it may oh, be no that we've got too many people with their cameras on, and unfortunately, this there's a bandwidth limitation in this program. It's okay. As as long as you can hear me, that's fine. I um, turned mine on. That should add one. A lot of people turn their cameras off just now. <laughs> Everybody's disappearing on me. So <laughs> worry, there should if you turn your camera on, it might work. Yeah. Okay, I'll try now. Nope. No. Anyway, doesn't it's, anyway, it's okay. Okay, so tell um, us a little bit about how old are you? Sure, I'm 61. Six, did you say 61? 61, yes, yes. Okay. And um, I was diagnosed in uh, February. Um, I'm treated uh, at uh, Johns Hopkins uh, Extension over at Sibley Hospital in Washington, D.C. Okay, I so live, let's go. Yes. So where do you live? Live in Arlington, Virginia, nearby. Okay. Um, I wanted to uh, take this opportunity to thank uh, Jim Marshall, who uh, sent me to to the who, who introduced me to AnCan. Um, mm -hmm. and I've been I've been corresponding with him. Uh, in terms of my numbers and and you know diagnosis and so on, um, uh, I started out with a PSA of 33, uh, Gleason mm -hmm. 8, 4 plus 4. Um, and I have been on uh, bicalutamide uh, for a, for a, a three weeks or so. About two weeks ago, I got my first shot of Eligard. Uh, I just got back my um, the results of my blood test, uh, and so the PSA has gone down to 12, mm -hmm. and uh, testosterone is at 24. So apparently the uh, the ADTs are are working, and um, let's see what else can I tell you. Um, I, so, I I haven't yeah, I, I to say I, I haven't done any gen genetic testing. I, I would like to do it. I do have a, a history of um, cancer in my family. My father actually died of uh, complications of prostate cancer about ten years ago or so. So who is your who is being treated? Who's treating you? Um, it's a team over at Sibley Hospital uh, in DC. Um, my uh, oncologist is Dr. Halthor, uh, and I have a um, uh, a urologist as well. So who uh, is? You, I, I, could you spell your oncologist's name? Sure. His name is uh, his. I'm looking for his uh, first name. So his first name is Aditya. It's A D I T H I I A, and the last name is Halthor. It's H A L T H O R E. Okay, and you have and the, all... yeah, and he's and, at Sibley. At Sibley, yeah, yeah. And then the one and... last thing I'll, I'll add regarding um, uh, you know future treatment is that I'm going to meet with a, a doctor over at Johns Hopkins who's a specialist on uh, seed therapy. Uh, I'm going to be meeting with him at the end of the month and he'll determine whether I'm a good candidate for uh, seed therapy. If I am, they're going to start with that uh, and then uh, do five weeks of external radiation. So before yeah. we get there, yeah. have they done any imaging on you? Yes. Yes, they have done. So They've done both. Of... Yeah, both MRI and uh, PET PET scan. Yeah. And what did they What did they reveal? 
they revealed um, that both sides of the prostate uh, are infected, um, as, as well as the uh, seminal um, glands. Um, and the, there's, it's not quite clear. There was a little bit of a, um, what do they call it? Uh, not marking, but um, uh, th th there is a suspicion. They haven't been able to determine conclusively whether a, um, 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 uh, I'm, I'm, I'm now blanking on the uh, terminology here. Uh, a lymph node is, is infected mm -hmm. as well. They're not sure about that, but uh, apparently so not. So at the moment, the, the diagnosis is that it's confined to the prostate and seminal vesicles. Correct. Yes. However, I think what we're going to hear is that there's now new, better imaging methods which can detect prostate cancer much more sensitively. And I would be surprised if they're not going to recommend it. Have you dis has there been any discussion of getting either something called an Aximin scan or a PSMA PET scan? Yeah, the, the, that's they did the PSMA PET scan. That that they did do. They did, and what did yes. it show? Yes, and so that's it, it. It did show what I just described with okay. uh, an inconclusive uh, um, uh, marking or or suspicion uh, at one of the lymph nodes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, but at the moment, it really looks like a confined disease, which is why they're sending you to somebody to whether they're going to deal with just irradiate your prostate. Correct. And then, the, and then also the bed. Right. Now, yes. and you haven't had genetic testing yet, although given the, your history of uh, family history, it seems like it would be definitely something that ought to be done. Right. And and so a question I had is, okay, I know that that you know my father uh, died of complications of of prostate cancer. My sister had uh, breast cancer, um, and you know, if we go back to you know uh, um, earlier generations, then uh, both my father's parents and so on. If I know all that, what what good would the would the genetic testing do? Well, I mean, I know that there is a that, that the family has a history. Right, but what the genetic testing does is it finds whether there are mutations in specific genes. So, for example. One of the genes that's very much involved in breast cancer, you mentioned you have breast cancer, it was called BRCA1, BRCA1. It's a very, it predisposes people to breast cancer and it also predisposes people to prostate cancer. However, people with a BRCA1 mutation can be treated by a special drug, which is in the realm of what's called precision medicine so that the drug only works in people with that mutation. Uh, BRCA2 as well, however. Well, right, but mostly one. Uh, and the bottom line is if you have a, if there's a BRCA mutation in your family, that opens up a treatment avenue. It's not right. simply just information. Got it. My, uh, So that's the importance of genetics. Now you're being treated at Hopkins, you're being treated by a urologist, and, a, and I guess Hathor is, is not a GU oncologist. To the best of my understanding, he is a radiation oncologist. Hathor is a radiation oncologist. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you right now you're being treated by a yes. radiation oncologist and a urologist. Correct. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so, any, I guess, given that background, can is would somebody else like to ask? So, Ori, I guess I should ask. Do, what are the questions you have for us? Um, I I just like to <laughs> absorb as much as possible to listen, uh, and and learn. I I don't I don't have any specific questions at the moment, but they may arise as I as I go along. Yeah. So, so let let me let me let me give you um, a little bit of positive framework for this. Um, 
RE. Um, with seminal vesicle invasion four plus four, um, you sort of have to throw the book at the at the disease early on. And so the the concept of doing some type of brachytherapy, whether it be the seeds or the um or the high dose plus um IMRT um makes a lot of sense. How many how many cores were positive? You said it was on both sides, but how many cores did they take and how many were positive? Um, it, it was 12 cores, if I if I understand correctly, and all of them right. were positive. Right. So, you know, that type of disease, actually, um, I would be asking why they're even talking seeds, because what they should, well, I shouldn't say what they should be talking. What they normally would do with that much cancer is use high dose radiation where they um, they insert the radioactive rods rather than placing seeds. Mm -hmm. and, and it may be that that's what they explain to you, but but seeds are not right when you have so much cancer. Um, so you want to be asking them about high dose radiation, not low dose radiation. I, in my own case, I had the low dose radiation and the IMRT. When you have that in conjunction with seminal, seminal vesicle invasion, um, it's been shown that the best outcomes would probably be uh, high dose radiation, high dose radiation brachytherapy plus IMRT plus um somewhere between 24 months and 36 months of hormone therapy and you may well um get a durable remission out of that now um it it doesn't make sense and i don't know if they had this discussion but it doesn't make sense in my view to do surgery because the chances are with that type of diagnosis, you're almost certainly going to need radiation and hormone therapy anyway. Right. But there That's are some people. Doing. Right. And, and we could show that to you. We could show you the, the nomograms and the calculations. And I was in a similar situation. And that's the reason I didn't do the surgery first, um, because there's no point in, 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 in giving yourself yet another set of side effects. Um, right. Now, to go back to the question you asked, and it was a really good one about, well, even if I find that I, I mean, it, it, the likelihood is, I shouldn't say the likelihood, but that there's, there's a very good chance with this sort of history that you have that, that, that you also carry a BRCA uh, gene. Okay. I, I, I'm suspecting from your name that you, um, you're probably Ashkenazi Jewish. With, That's with a correct. Name like Laurie. Right on my father's side, yes. Right, and so, you know, that could be that, that makes you even more likely to to have acquired the the BRCA gene, probably BRCA two. Um, how would it affect your treatment right now? It probably would not, because. I haven't really heard anybody being prescribed a PARP inhibitor up front. At the same time, um, you know, there may be um, there may be trials going on right now where somebody like you, they do add a PARP inhibitor to the uh, to the Lupron, and um, and it, and it's worth a discussion. And that's probably why you need. Um, after you get the testing, if it turns out that you are, um, you carry that BRCA gene, I definitely would be talking with a medical oncologist, a, G, a GU med onc. And um, there's a good one. Uh, we were talking before about the PROMISE trial. Um, and, and you're a great candidate for that PROMISE trial. And, and I think Jeff Marchi put it in the chat window. One of the principal investigators for that PROMISE trial is at Sibley. Uh, Channing Pala, P A L L E R, and that's a lady that you you know you might want to meet with. She's going to be talking to our group to um to us in a couple of uh, in about six weeks. She's going to be talking to us. But um, you know, 
I think that once you get that that germline result, that inherited result, you'll come back here, you'll talk with us, and, and we can guide you um, to to a good genito urinary medical oncologist. So that that's my two cents for what it's worth. Great, great advice. Thank you. Yeah, um, I was going to say, um, I, I had when I first got diagnosed, I did have the seed therapy. Um, and it, you know, it, 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 it reduced my PSA, um, gradually for about two years. And then after that, my PSA picked up again and I had to have an additional radiation after that. Um, but if you want to know anything else about the seed therapy, I'm more than willing to share what, you know, my experience. Right. Thank you. Who was this? And Eric, it's Eric. 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 Okay, thank you. And Eric, you're you're in the um you're in that that area, right? Where right, are you? Eric. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess um he's in Arlington. I'm in um Glen Burnie, Maryland, and I go to uh John Hopkins um oncologist in Lutherville or, or Timonium. But yeah, it's I'm I'm in the local area. But I thought you went to see a GU oncologist also at down at in Baltimore. Well, she she's she just she's part of that, but she's not in the Baltimore main campus. She's just in Timonium, but she's okay. uh, John Hopkins. Mm -hmm. And uh, her name is uh, uh, Kathy Marshall. Right, Catherine Handy Marshall. Right. Another good one. I didn't realize that she was not at down at the main campus, but she was up north in Timonium. But that's useful information. So, Ori, uh, do you have yes. any other questions for us this evening? No, not at the moment. And thank, thank you to everyone who uh, listened and and uh, you know, commented. You know, we as we meet every week, uh, alternating between uh, Mondays and Tuesdays. So next week we'll be meeting Tuesday at uh, six o'clock Eastern time, rather than eight. So it's a little tricky to keep track. So please join us again. Thank you. And anyone else that has anything they'd like to say to Ari up front? Maybe somebody who, who might have had seminal vesicle invasion at diagnosis? I guess uh, not. But no, Ari, I, 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 uh, I had surgery. Go ahead, Len. Yeah, I, I had seminal vesicle inver invasion and I also had um, well, I had two or three lymph nodes light up. And I was going to say to Ari that uh, you'll know if that lymph node was uh, positive if after the uh, hormone therapy, it gets smaller. If it doesn't, probably wasn't prostate cancer. But if it does, it almost certainly is prostate cancer, in which case your radiation should include the whole pelvic region in addition to the prostate. Got it, got it, thanks. Yeah, sure. I, I, I don't know whether, I, I don't know whether, does radiation wipe out the seminal vesicles? I mean, it's essentially it's a sign that you've got systemic disease. And, yeah. And uh, it's gonna, uh, you know, the cat's out of the bag. So someplace down the line, we're going to treatment probably. So, so Peter, they can they can treat. They, can, can, where's, where's our chief muter? There you go. Um, they can treat seminal seminal vesicle invasion with brachytherapy, which okay. is what they usually do. Um, and they can certainly treat seminal vesicle invasion with with the with the high dose radiation. Yes. Um, For sure. And you know, and I think I, I suspect this is what they're going to be talking to you about, Ari. Is the high dose radiation? Got it. Okay. Okay. So, Ari, we look forward to hearing about your progress in the future. Thanks, Thanks very much. Okay. Let's. We will move on to our uh, regular meeting, our our attendees, and let's start with. Mike Yancey. Okay, yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, I just want to get get your all's input and commentary. 
let me give you some numbers real quick. Uh, basically, back in November 29th, my PSA had dropped to 0 0.07. And then on March 3rd, it had risen ever so slightly to 0.12. And then I had it checked on May 11th, and it had increased, almost quadrupled, to 0.43. And uh, at that time, my local oncologist uh, seemed to indicate that that was nothing to be concerned about. However, over the weekend, he did send me a note and said he'd like to see me again in July and do another PSA test as well as some other blood work. So I kind of get the feeling he does have some, some concerns, and I just thought I'd get your all's input on where you felt like a rise like that, even though the, 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 the numerical number itself is still under one. Is that something you all would also be concerned about? Oh, any comment? It's a high so, doubling rate. You've got to do something uh, if it keeps up. Yeah, and I think that's part of why he's asked me to come now, even though he originally was not, but now he's going to do another PSA check here in about a little less than two months, right at two months. So are you on, what are you being treated with at the moment? Well, of course, I'm on Lupron, Lupron since, uh, you know, last year. Uh, of course, I had chemo last year, finished that up in November. And then I started abiraterone about six weeks ago. Yeah. So I, I'm just I'm just reading through my notes here, Mike, and I think there's a couple of things. I think the first thing is that um, th they haven't debulked your tumor, and that's certainly something that probably needs to be discussed, which we we said to you last time. Um, the fact that your uh, you're on abiraterone and your PSA is still rising from 0.12 to now 0.43 um, is, um, is, is significant, especially after the docetaxel. Um, you know, I think your best move um, that you've already made is the appointment that you're going to have with uh, Dr. E on the 24th. Right. Right. And and um, I think that she's probably going to set you on a, a on a better path than what you're on, and that may include um, some radiation. Um, you, you you clearly need some sequencing done. I think that no sequencing has been ordered of any sort either germline or somatic and i think that's pretty important yeah, I, did, um, I, did, I did have some germline done but that's it oh you had germline done and, yeah. and was there anything on the germline or was that negative no it was all negative yeah so you know i definitely think um you probably need some somatic sequencing um i think i think that that's probably right in line and um and you know maybe adjusting some of these drugs because it, it's strange there are a percentage of men that 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 fail aberaterone we, we we've known them um they they've been around for a while um it's been, I shouldn't say they've been around it. The, the knowledge has been around for a while. I'm trying to remember the percentage. I think it's around 20 to 30% of men fail abiraterone. And so maybe you're better off on, on, on a different drug. But I would say hang in there and, and see, see what Dr. E has to say. Um, have you discussed with your doc that you're going to be going to see a, a specialist, a specialized GU medical oncologist? Yes, I have absolutely. He's he's just uh, wanting me to get back with him if uh, as I as I as I put it, uh, if I hire her or not. Okay, so he he's on board with you doing that. A absolutely. Yeah, that's great. great. Okay. Yeah, I mean that that's really positive because as we heard last week from John and others that sometimes it, it isn't good, but that that's a really good sign. So you know, I I, I would say just hang in um until you see dr e next week and see what she's got yeah up her sleeve for you 
Yeah, no, I appreciate it. I plan to do that. And of course, I was just interested in your all's perspective and you've given it to me and I, I very much appreciate it. Hey, Great. Mike, if, if you're on Abbey, I didn't realize you were on Abbey, but what after I started my PSA after a year went up to 2.2, it is now 0.2 at a year and a half. So you never know with Abbey. It's, a lot of us, it's gone up and down and it ends up taking a long time before you have to do something. Mm. Yeah, that's good information, Jeff. I... Right. I mean, yeah, thank it, you. it does bounce, but if it's a trend, then you, it, Jeff, you're you're muted. Yeah, I know. I, it, it's hard to to say because you know you and I were both at one point six two times in a row at the same time. Right. Mine, and I went, mine went up. Yours went up. And then mine went down and down and down, and it's like I say, it's at point two. So you never know. I mean, I, right. I mine went up quickly and it came down quickly. So it so, it, it may work for him. It may not. I think Dr. E is the right person to figure yes. all this out. Yeah. So Look, great. Looking forward, looking forward to know, it. Thank for, you. The, for those of you who are who are listening and you're wondering, well, why is it so important to have a GU med onc? And it's because Prostate cancer is, it, it performs very inconsistently. It's very, um, it's very heterogeneous. And if you see somebody who specializes in this disease, they're more likely to have dealt with the situation before rather, rather than a generalist who just sort of looks in the book and says, this is what I'm supposed to give you. But this is why we really like the idea of you seeing a specialist doc. For prostate cancer. Okay. Well, let us know, you'll let us know what happens after your appointment with Dr. E, Mike. Most certainly will. Thank you. Great. So, Alan Moskowitz, tell us what's up. Okay. Hopefully you can hear me. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So, um, I had a very bad experience happen to me in the past few days. Uh, just to recap, I had surgery nine years ago, had radiation in 2016, salvage radiation. Um, and I've been on um, uh, Lupron and enzalutamide roughly since the beginning of the year. My PSA is undetectable. Everything was going well, except um, Wednesday mid-morning, I found myself in a situation I could not urinate. The best I could do was a uh, a blood clot and i ended up in the emergency room at my local hospital where they catheterized me and the um the covering urologist for my urologist came in and he had to uh, irrigate my bladder and flush out all of these clots i had a huge number of blood blood clots that were basically clogging the pipeline and um, he thought, my medical oncologist also thought, that this was probably um, a latent radiation cystitis. And that, you know, for some reason, the blood vessels, in this case, become a bit fragile. And this is six years later, almost to the day. Um, and, um, you know, something burst or leaked. And... Um, um, it was really, you know, they kept me overnight. It was a really a, uh, you know, not a very pleasant uh, experience. But the blood had stopped um, you know, blood flow probably in a few hours because when the um, oncologist, I'm sorry, when the urologist did his work around uh, six or seven o'clock at night, he, he was able to eventually get a uh, a colorless uh, uh, effluent from my bladder. So I want to ask: Is this sort of, uh, you know, I mean, it's hematuria is a technical name, but is this from the radiation? And, um, you know, what's people's experience? Is this a one-off thing or is this something that's going to get worse and worse over time? I mean, I'm on a Botox every, you know, number of months to control the, I'll call it overactive bladder, which has been reasonably successful. Um, but this was a, a bit of a shock, uh, to say the least. Fortunately, I recovered pretty well, went home the next day, 
and was even able able to uh, go into Manhattan to to see a Broadway play on on Saturday evening. Um, so any, I'll take any thoughts. I've not heard this come up uh, in recent memory from the group. Uh, anybody have a comment? Because frankly, I haven't heard it either. I haven't I have either, but because Alan mentioned he's getting Botox injections for his bladder, yes. I mm -hmm. wonder if that may have played a part in all of this. Just a guess. I don't know. Yeah, and you know, I asked the urologist that, and they said, well, your last treatment was three months ago. And so they didn't think it was related. Could it be? Of course. Um, could I have exercised too hard the day before? Unlikely. Um, passing a difficult bowel movement, they said it's possible. Um, he said sometimes it's, you know, taking too much Advil or a leave could trigger it and i was on sort of uh, that intermittently for something else i mean no one could give me the sort of the proximate cause of this episode um uh, but it was um you know certainly very painful until uh, i could get the emergency room to do the catheter so al so let me did they actually did the urologist give you any information about whether they thought this would be chronic or it's a one-off thing? He couldn't tell me. He just, he said, just, I, I don't really know. It's the first time I've had it. So, you know, I guess if I have it again, then maybe it'll be uh, chronic, but um, maybe, or maybe something that could pop up at any time. The urology, the medical oncologist that I have said he's seen this before. It was not surprising yeah. to him. He was nearly certain it stemmed from the radiation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I have, I have we've one. Seen I it have before. A... We've seen it before in the group. Um, not that often, but we've had guys that have had clots. Um, and, and, you know, the thing with, with radiation cystitis is that it can take a long time to manifest. Um, I mean, I had episodes between five and seven or eight years out, repeated episodes. Now, um, you're getting bladder injections for your boat for you're getting Botox injections for your bladder. I'm assuming that's because you you've got um, you've got issues. Um, you've got bladder issues. Um, it, uh, frequency or something similar to that. Is that right, Alan? That's right. It's uh, frequency is part of it. It's the uh, urgency that has been and the, the urgency. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's a, just so, a, you know, it, what that says to me. And again, I'm not a doc, but what that says to me is you've already you've got something that's irritating the bladder. And that's what's causing um, this frequency and this urgency because the bladder's wanting to contract and 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 uh, frequently and you know the botox is um, we know people that have gotten botox treatments especially in the ms group it's it's um we know several people in our multiple sclerosis group who have gotten botox treatments of the bladder and it's been very successful but um the the what i'm surprised about is whoever's giving you the that botox treatment um is a little surprised about about the the this response because what's the underlying cause what's causing your bladder to 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 act up like this all these years after you had your treatment yeah so let me just clarify so I, I will be seeing my urologist who does give me the Botox um, next week. What I saw at the hospital was a, a the urologist, a very experienced person who was covering for my my urologist. And so even though I gave him my background, you know, he, he could just tell me, yeah, it's, it's probably the cystitis, but we didn't go into more, more depth than that. Because remember, he's just the covering guy. So I mean, yeah. I, I'm kind of surprised that you haven't spoken to your to the guy that given what happened and 
you know, this was fairly calamitous that you haven't spoken to your urologist yet. Well, yeah, I did call the office and they sent me up with an appointment for next week. That was the best yeah, but... thing they'll do. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'm going to have a cystoscopy next week to see what's going on and okay. go from there. Okay, I mean, well, I, you know, you gotta be you got to be your own advocate. I know that if I finished up in the hospital after those Botox treatments, I'd, I'd be talking to my uh, urologist within 48 hours. I wouldn't be waiting two weeks, but people, yeah, everybody's different. Yeah, yeah, no, I understand. I mean, yeah, I, don't, I don't know. I, I just, uh, I'm not sure what to say. I mean, it'd make a fair point. Um, I guess if I have any discomfort or whatever, maybe I, I move it up. They said to wait a week before having a cystoscopy. So, you know, I, I, I couldn't do it at the end of this week. So it'll be next week. All right. So you've seen it. So it's possibly yeah. that. All right. That's fair enough. Yeah. And I mean, Steve Saft just put something in the chat yeah. window that, you know, he's aware of somebody who, um, who, who had, uh, persistent UTIs and and got clots and so you know when, yes. when, when he's had four or five episodes where he couldn't <laughs> urinate yeah that I mean night. when when the, I know when the bladder is acting up like that and you know it probably means that it's it's bleeding internally have you ever noticed any um have you noticed any pink pinkness <laughs> in your urine not at all this came as really? a big a big surprise and i had a urinalysis not that long ago so and i had a when they did the botox in february you know he did you know they do sort of a, a, a little bit of an exam and so they said well yeah if this was a a cancer or something probably you would have seen it the doctor would have seen it yeah. um would it be a cyst sure i mean so you know but it, it um it just um i haven't had any symptoms you know it's yeah. just a, well len, len just put some len you want to just you want you want to say what you put yeah, in there? summarize what that says please yeah it was just a mention of um under side effects for uh botox for overactive bladder it's uh, it talks about side effects and it said the other side effects include bleeding in the urine or urinary tract infection, which can occur right. with or without elevated right. post void residual residual. Right. All right, I'll That's look it. at that. Yeah, and I mean, John, I mean, John just said put something in the chat as well. Yeah, Would you I like see that. to elaborate? Yeah, I see that. Yeah, in my case, there was no um, no um, they did a culture, no uh, you know bad um, you know. Uh, pathology, not pathology, you no, know, you know, there were no, um, yeah, I don't know what the infections. word Infections. No infections. Right. Yeah. No infection and, no bacteria. Uh, you know, everything was, was good. I had no fever and, uh, you know, everything else was good. So it just really was a surprise. All right. I don't want to take up any more time. So, um, John, uh, John Ivory but, had something to say. And so yeah, that's the yeah, I I had blood in my urine. I, I don't know if it was a year and a half or two years after I had 40 rounds of proton radiation. Totally freaked me out and uh, went to the doc and did the cystoscopy. And he said that um, he didn't see anything and that uh, that happens every once in a while from radiation. They don't know what, what uh, the radiation did internally, but it wasn't something to worry about. So hopefully, hopefully that'll be the same with you because your situation is much more acute, acute than my own was. Yeah, well, yours was two years out, and um, here I'm six years out. It's so well, surprising, but they say yeah. it happens. It happens. Yeah. Okay. So, can so let us know what your urologist, urologist says. Yeah, I will. I'll report back probably in right. two weeks. Very good. Good. Thanks, everyone. Yep. Right. Can I get okay. one more question in? Sure. I, I'm sorry. Uh, Alan, how much difference did the Botox make for your uh, situation? A huge difference. Night and day. In so fact, uh, the, first, the first treatment lasted about five months, 
and I could have a little bit of caffeine. I could have, you know, a citrus fruit. I could go on with my life completely normal. The second treatment wasn't quite as effective. It was still good, but I had to be a little bit more careful on my diet. Um, and I was going to probably ask the guy to have another treatment uh, the end of this month. But now with this episode, actually, it's sort of aggravated the bladder. And I probably need to have one, you know, sooner rather than later. Um, but it was very successful. I had, I had the old, I tried all the drugs. I tried the uh, electric stimulation, you know, with the, uh, through the ankle and nerve in that area. Um, the PTTNS or PTNS, something like that. Um, and so I was very pleased with it. Okay. So I, I want to say one quick thing on this topic before we leave. Um, guys, mark down in your diary June the 1st um, at 8 o'clock Eastern. June the 1st at 8 o'clock Eastern in this room. We've got Steve Kaplan, Dr. Steve Kaplan coming to talk to us. And his topic is BPH. And I think he's actually calling it it ain't the it ain't the it ain't your grandfather's BPH is I think what he's he's calling the uh his wow. title. And That's correct. we're gonna talk about a lot of these issues that that um that men have in terms of frequency and <laughs> in, in terms of urgency. And whilst it's basically a BPA, it's basically on BPH, um, he specializes in benign prostate issues. And um, I think that you'll be able to answer him, ask him a lot of questions like around Botox okay. and, and things like Great. things like that. But before we move on, Sylvester, you had a comment. Well, everything that I was going to say have already been said. So thank you anyway. But what would you have I said? Had episode, I had an episode last month. For the last five to six years, it's a common procedure for me. And my uh, oncologist doesn't have any problems, but I didn't have a bladder backup like this gentleman. Whenever I was urine, the urine would come out and it would be red blood. And it would only be for a short period of time. And at first I was almost out of my mind. I thought I was dying. But uh, after I talked to the oncologist at the first time and the second time and last month, and I went to see him last week and I told him about the episode, but he didn't seem to be that overly concerned. And I've learned to live with that. Well, yeah, I mean, I think you're just lucky that it's a small amount of blood and it's not clotting and block, blocking anything. Yeah, I mean, in my case, I thought, I mean, the pressure of the volume of the urine plus the, yeah. the uh, overactive bladder would push it all out. But there right. wasn't a chance. These, these clots were huge right. and there were so many. Right. Okay, well, we'll just have to see how it goes with the urologist next week. Yeah, very good. Thank you all. Okay, we will move on. Ben, tell us what's up. I'm going to squash it way down. Uh, I will have a, a lung biopsy next week, and there'll be a much more exciting story to follow. Mm -hmm. That's all but for tonight. A, a I lung think. biopsy for what? on what basis? Well, that's that's the fun part. We'll see. Uh, I have I have uh, nodules that I've had for a long time and they've grown, um, but we'll see. It might be, it might not be anything. Yeah, well, let's hope for the best there for sure. Okay, well we'll, we'll be hearing more. Jim Marshall, what's up? Uh, um, yes. Uh, hold on. Ho ho hold on a second. Hold on a second. Okay. What I want to say to Ben is that um, there's other guys with experience of lung nodules in this group, Ben, um, and where they, they've, and, and I think one of them is Frank Fabish. Am I right, Frank? Was it you with lung nodules? 
Yes. I've had blood nodules as well, Alan. Okay. I think we should talk a little bit about this rather than moving through it because we have peer experience okay. here. And it may be helpful for Ben in talking to his doctor. <laughs> so let, let's hear from Frank and let's hear from Alan on, on lung nodules. Uh, August of uh, last year, um, I had an Oxman PET scan at the VA and they found three nodules on my lungs and they were all around a one centimeter size. Um, my GU oncologist at the James Cancer Hospital uh, looked at it and he said, uh, usually if they're less than three centimeters, they're not, they're benign. He said, but I don't like the way it looks. So uh, I'm going to give you um, a, a biopsy. And so within two weeks, I had the biopsy done and the results came back and his numbers were 95% of the population have lung nodules and, and they're small and they aren't, uh, uh, they aren't malignant. Well, I was part of the 5% that it didn't apply to and mine were, and that's when he went ahead right away with the chemotherapy and uh, went after it. But I had hesitation on having the biopsy. Um, he, they recommended a needle biopsy because of the uh, possibility of a collapsed lung. But that didn't happen and uh, everything worked out for the better for me. Oh, were, were they prostate cancer or lung cancer? No, it was prostate cancer. It was metastatic. Mm. Uh, so that that validated it, and then it solidified the uh, course of treatment uh, by my doc. And what was your treatment? Uh, I was uh, uh, I was on ADT treatment and uh, fer uh, Firmagon injections at 28 days, and I had six treatments of docetaxel from uh, January through the end of April. And now I, after the, we finished that treatment, uh, the lung nodules were, hadn't grown, but many, uh, but they also found many smaller nodules and most of those disappeared. Now, I, I have a question, Frank. You said three centimeters. Did you mean three millimeters? millimeters. Yes. Uh, one centimeter. Hmm. You said it, but you said if they're bigger than three, if they're smaller than three centimeters, did you mean three millimeters? No, three, uh, from, from what I can remember, it was three centimeters. If they're larger than three centimeters, they consider it a mass and it most likely is, uh, is malignant. But under that number, uh, they don't consider, they uh, don't feel that it will be uh, malignant. Okay, because that's, a, I mean, that's, that's quite big. large. That's about an inch. Three centimeters is almost an inch. It's bigger than Well, it's inch. not three centimeters. It's the, each one was about one centimeter. And okay. Okay. 2.54 centimeters to an inch. That's yes. correct. Right. And, so, and Frank, did, did your nodules, at least the larger, these large ones, did they shrink? Uh, they they went down a little bit in size. What he did for me after the chemotherapy was he pulled up the uh, CT scan of my lungs and he showed me uh, what the, what it was in October and then what it was in May and they were sequenced so that you could see um, each frame and look at the lungs at the same angle with the same uh, with the same appearance and see whether the nodules had changed or not and um, 
and it, it really made a big difference to try to understand it and uh, and being able to see uh, why he felt that the uh, chemotherapy uh, uh, was uh, was successful. Mm -hmm. And Alan, what, what was your experience with lung nodules? Right. So my case is, is uh, not as far along as, as Frank's. In my case, the, um, I had um, the nodules were discovered with the new Polarify scan. Um, and my largest nodule was just under a centimeter. The others were about a little under a half a centimeter, four millimeters three millimeters, um, and they could it could not be biopsied because it was too small and because of its location. Um, they didn't give it much of a, more than a 50% chance of getting a satisfactory biopsy. So basically, my doctor agreed to, let's just treat me with, uh, in my case, it's uh, Lupron and, and Zalutamide, and, um, and then do another CAT scan in six months and see how much the uh, those uh, spots shrink, the nodules shrink. Interestingly, in hindsight, those spots were identified with, um, I'll say, polarified, um, mm. even as far back as three years ago when I was at NIH for a, a clinical trial, and they were only one or two millimeters, but they were thought to be irrelevant by yeah. having, you know, and so, um, but and they weren't irrelevant. They were the start of, of these nodules. Um, hmm. And, um, you know, I, I guess, you know, there's, it didn't, it didn't, I'll say, use the word glow, or, you know, and um, su sufficiently, um, but again, people had inexperience reading that sort of a scan then, and um, I'm glad I did them because um, it showed up. I think also an Aximin, there may have been something, I don't recall offhand whether that showed anything. So that's where I'm at. Um, I was just cautioned that my PSA will drop faster, which it did, than the shrinkage of the tumor. So I don't know what to expect in six months. I'm hoping for half the size, but I'm only guessing. So when when did you? I know you got a scan in October. When when is the next scan gonna be? Um, I had the the I had a the polarifier in October. I had a an additional CT scan, a little more detailed one in October. Um, and now I'm going to have a CT scan in July. July, okay. Yep, it's all, so, it's all so set. The next scan, next scan will be so, July. So, so Ben, how big are these nodules? Did they give you a size? They did. Um, they're inching up, so to speak, to what to the centimeter size, where they can be biopsied. Uh huh. There are two. Okay. So they're still relatively small. Yes. Okay. Ben, so are, they in, are they in a location that's biopsyable? The um, my oncologist suggested the biopsy. I would have waited for a PSMA scan, uh, which he suggested. Well, I'm going to do an informed consent thing. They're going to explain to me what the procedure is, what the risks are uh, later this week, and if I assent, um, I'll have the biopsy next week. Uh -huh. so, so is this going to be a needle biopsy or are they going to go um, th through your mouth? That's, yeah, I'm curious about that too. I will learn later this week what the plans okay, are. Well, hopefully this discussion has been helpful for you so that you can ask the right questions when you have that conversation, Ben. Yes, thank you. Yeah, but I recall from my discussion with my MO on, on this the, the question of whether something can be reached by for biopsy was was um if the if the nodule is not too deep in the lungs meaning not too distal from your um bronchial tubes then they can snake a you know a, a contraption in right and, <laughs> and sample it 
Otherwise, they go puncture it right through your chest where you may have a, I don't know, one out of three chance of the lung deflation. That's not a, necessarily a big deal. I mean, in my case, I didn't think they'd have any trouble doing a needle biopsy. I said, you know, I've had a smaller sample even when I had my prostate um, biopsy. And they said to me, yeah, but you know, your lungs are moving and mine is near my heart. So <laughs> they, they didn't really want to take a chance. And I didn't want to take a chance either. I didn't right. think there'd be anything to be gained, um, you know, by with that level of risk. So um, yeah, Thank just you. keep in mind the risk. Great. Thank you. So we are move, we are getting late here with a lot more guys to go. Jim, you said to be quick, but let's hear what you want. Don't don't be unduly quick. Well, <laughs> it'll be um, quick, quick. Anyway, I am I am uh, starting a drug holiday. I have been on Lupron and the Abiraterone now for fifty seven months. So anyway, I decided um, that it's about time to take a holiday. Mm -hmm. That's it. Right. And well, that that that's that's great. I mean, the the one thing that we always say about a holiday is that it's good up front to have the discussion with your doc so that you know what the markers are as to how long it's going to last. You know, it, it's, um, I mean, Ben will, uh, ben, Len will say, we got too many ENs at the end, Ken and Ben and Len. Um, Len will tell you this, but it's really a good idea to say, okay, when my PSA gets to X or to Y, or when this happens, then we know that's when we're going to start talking about going back on. Have, have you had a discussion uh, yes, like that, that, Jim? Yes, I did that. And what are you thinking? Well, uh, actually, okay, on the Abbey uh, starts now. Okay, the Lupron starts in uh, July. Right. And uh, sometime down the road, okay, at the time where the PSA gets to, uh, uh, gets to about a one, okay, at that point, I believe I will start back on things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's a plan. Sounds like that's a plan. plan. Well, let's hope for the best okay. there. I'm done. Okay. Anybody? Anybody comment? Any comment? Yeah. I mean, anybody else who's who's who got any words of a of advice for Jim? You know, who's starting his first IHT? And any anyone else who's done a drug holiday have anything that you we can share with with, with Jim? I did yeah, a year ago. And, okay, first, um, Peter. Go ahead, Peter. I stopped Lupron a year ago, a year ago, July, and I've just been on monotherapy, uh, darolutamide. I tried cutting that in half a month ago, and it went south uh, in three weeks, so I uh, went back on full dose, but I'm still off Lupron and feel better for it. Jim, I'm just wondering, uh, I had about the same amount of time of non-detect on my the PS, PSA and when I took my drug holiday. Um, but I think I would have, if I do it again, it would have a lot more frequent PSA testing, maybe once a month. Absolutely. Um, anyway, the doctor has me on the uh, same test, okay, every month. Okay, yeah. I'm still on it. And I said, hallelujah, mama. Yeah, I was in a little different situation. I was doing every three months, but when it was getting towards it, it started to rise. Uh, and then I consulted with uh, my GU Medoc on it. And he wanted me to do, this was before they approved the PSMA. The only place I could get it was at UCLA. And it took some time to get scheduled in there, which I hadn't accounted for. I thought it was a good idea as being that it's growing up, let's find out where it's growing and agreed to do the PSMA scan. So that, you know, in the meantime, the PSA kept rising. So just from an anxiety issue, uh, 
it was a little tough. And then my uh, my doc took a vacation, and I didn't get the results to, with review with him. I did get the report from UCLA. So just some things at the end point could take more time than what you think to get back on schedule. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Now, Jim, has somebody talked to you about tapering off the steroids? Yes. Um, uh, that's occurring now. Good. Okay. Yeah. Because you can't stop that cold turkey. No. No. Yes, I understand that very, very well. Good. Okay. Good. Got to make okay. sure. Got to take care of you, Captain. Right. <laughs> right. Amen, okay. brother. Okay, next. Al, tell us what's up. Okay, um, camera's on. Okay, good. So um, just a quick little background. I finished the lutetium six cycles this, at the end of last January. Um, and two months later, my PSA started rising again. And Dr. Scholz, Scholz had me add um, abiraterone and, and uh, prednisone to that, uh, which was a few weeks ago now. And he also wanted me to do the ProVenge routine. And I'm in Florida and he's in California. So he recommended that I see a local uh, doctor, which, which I scheduled a few weeks ago. And then it got postponed until last week. And I went to see the doctor at University of Miami uh, last Wednesday. And he said, well, you can't do ProVenge when you're on Abiraterone. And it's going to take a month or more for you to phase off, phase down, um, you know, the prednisone. Um, so we can't do the, um, uh, so we, we can't start the ProVenge until at least the end of June. So I didn't know what to say about that one way or the other. The next day I had um, a Zoom meeting with Dr. Schulz, and he says, no, 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 that's not true. It's not a problem. We do it all the time. So, so yeah, they I, did. They, so, um, Al, so, I had a conversation before I had my ProVenge over the same thing with Larry Fong. And Larry said, no problem. And he's Mr. ProVenge, Dr. ProVenge. So, um, well, so, so now, um, um, and the Dr. Souls also gave me a contact at, um, at with the ProVenge people to try to get some more ammunition to go back to my to the doctor at the University of Miami, um, Dr. Sengal. Who, yeah. who are you seeing at the University of Miami? Sengal. Sengal. Okay. So and again, so I'm going to I'm going to go back to him tomorrow and tell him what. Uh, Los Angeles is telling me, and uh, I, I don't know whether, because because when he told me that uh, last week, he kind of gave me a cross-eyed look that that uh, that my doctor in California was crazy um, for doing that. Okay. So, what? Just uh, Al, just tell him that we that that one of our guys actually had a conversation with Doctor Fong. Doctor Larry Fong is the principal investigator for Provenge. He was the guy that basically established, discovered the whole ProVenge process, and he got it through the FDA in 2010. He's also on our advisory board. So if Dr. Singal has any questions, the first thing to say to him is, look, Dr. Fong, is of the, who is a GU medical oncologist, is of the opinion that it doesn't make a difference. And if he wants, we can try and arrange a, a, a conversation between Singal and and uh, and Dr. Fong. But as you hear, uh, Herb, who's pretty well versed himself, had that conversation with Dr. Fong and was told, no, it's fine. So even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't want to take, and as you know, Mark Schultz is controversial. And sometimes mentioning his name is like showing red to a bull. And, um, but he can't be arguing with Larry Fong about this. Well, apparently there was also uh, something called the STAMP trial where they investigated um, using uh, 
using Provenge with abiraterone and without, and didn't find that it was any problem. I, I assume you're familiar with that too, like because uh, California trial? gave. What's the name of the trial? Uh, Stamp trial, I think. Stamp, S T A M P. I believe so. Yeah. And I am not familiar with it, but maybe Len or Herb or some of the others are familiar with well, it. Maybe but I'm saying maybe I'm saying the name wrong, but um, they um, they gave me some information <laughs> on it. So, well, I don't know how the doctor is going to react. I mean, he may just refuse. He may, you know, he may, may just say, "Well, that's my opinion, and that's the way it is." I didn't react at all last week because I didn't know about it one way or the other. Um, in the meantime, I want to get this going, you know? <laughs> right. right. Well, you know, my, my response to that would be, if he says this is the way it is, um, I would say a couple of things. I would say, look, why don't you talk to the Dendrion people? That's one thing. I would say, why don't you talk to Dr. Fong, who is who, who prescribes Zytiga all the time and, and, and was the original... Uh, um, discoverer of Provenge. And I, I would say to him, well, you know, would you mind me seeing Dr. Belusic then? <laughs> That's another thing. Would you, you know, ask him, do you mind me going over and, and speaking to Dr. Belusic? Who's, who's that? So Dr. Belusic, B-I-L-U-S-I-C. Uh, -I Mar Mario Belusic. Right. I'll, put, I'll put it in the... Um, in the chat window for you in a second. He's a colleague of um, of Singal, and he's there all the time. He doesn't take vacations, and we've met with him. We think he's good. Um, I think he's he's mo mo a lot more modern thinking, and um, he we, we've asked him if we've got men who are not happy with Singal, can they see you? He said with 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 Singal's approval, yes, they can. Okay. Um, he's at Sylvester. I, he's a GU. He he's the guy who he's the chief of the GU medical service at Sylvester. Okay. All right. Well, that's uh, and and his, did you put? I will do. Uh, Just give me a second. Right. I'm gonna look. Right. I'm gonna look up that. I'm gonna look up that trial. Um. But I, at least I certainly didn't find any, I mean, because I was taking Abby right up until my Proven started. I mean, you researched this at length, didn't you, Al? Right. Uh, uh, yes, absolutely. Um, you know, I mean, you know, sometimes these guys that they, they, they don't expect you to come back with ammunition, Al. And, and when you come back with ammunition, if they say, well, you know, it's my way or the highway, they ain't the right doctor for you. So, well, so I, 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 I understand that. And uh, this, this is an excellent tip that uh, I was, you know, I was kind of taken aback by it to begin with. I mean, I, I really only went there to have somebody that would uh, administer the Provenge, and and uh, he's he's not uh, you know anyway. But this is a good tip to have another doctor there. So I, I really appreciate that, and uh, I guess uh, tomorrow I'll see where it goes. Right. Okay. I just put Belusic's uh, right. I just put Belusic, URL in the chat window for you. Okay. okay. All right. Great. I appreciate that. So uh, that's my story for today. Okay, we'll be hearing more next week about how your interaction. Okay. Okay, Peter Thank Monica. You. Oh, hi, yeah, I just want to give a quick update. Uh, <clears throat> I am uh, 327 days on uh, Zytiga and still undetectable, but who's counting? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I saw my uh, oncologist uh, a week ago, got labs, and uh, everything's looking good. I uh, had a question. Um, my oncologist, Dr. Patel, with uh, Mount Sinai, is proposing that I get uh, scans in July, sort of to do a reality check. I think he's thinking the Asmin scan. He's also going to do a bone density test. 
just because I'm on bone density meds and I guess he wants to check to see how I'm doing with that. Uh, there was no talk of me getting any holiday uh, prior to the scan. So I was just wondering, does that make sense uh, to be going for a scan like a asthma scan uh, while I'm still undetectable um, and still actively on you know, Lupron and, uh, and Abby? That was my question. Well, if your PSA is undetectable, it's not an indication for either an Aximan or a PSMA PET scan. It's not. No, because what are they going to see? That's what I was thinking. <laughs> so, I mean, there's, I don't know. there are published data about the sensitivity of both of those scans, and the published data are that less than about 0.5, point, you know, the accuracy drops off, and if it's zero, what's to see? What, where are they going to find anything? Is there any point in doing it for a reality check to make sure things are stable? I had a couple of bone nets. I mean, and if the PSA that. is, I can't, Steve, I don't know, maybe somebody else, Glenn, what do you think? But if your PSA is zero, what can you hope for? Yeah, certainly I agree with you, Herb, that a PSMA is useless. Um, but uh, I guess they want to check to see if there is some um, mutated form of prostate cancer that's oh, not maybe. producing PSA, okay. not producing PSMA. So, you know, they maybe a CT or an MRI scan would be more appropriate. Well, the, the, the test actually reads um, PET scan non-FPG oncologic. Yeah. I don't know what that non, means. Non-FTG, FT, it says F, FPG. Uh, Non-FPG, Frank Peter George. I don't know what that means. It doesn't actually say Aximan. Sure it isn't uh, FD as in David, FDG. That could be a D, yes, yes. FDG. Not, but it says non-FDG. Non-FDG, what is that? I mean, I FDG, F, FDG is a tracer which would localize non, which would localize cancer, prostate cancer, independently of PSA. So if you have a cancer that's not making PSA and it's significant, FDG will pick it up. But I don't know what the non-FDG means. I, I would clue. guess that means that's probably a, a PSMA or or a, or a Axiomin scan. Um, and, and yeah, and I I would agree. I mean, what Len's saying is it should be if they're going to do anything, it probably should be an FDG because the Axiomin and the and and the any type of PSMA scan not going to show anything with right. with un, unless your PSA is quite a bit higher so I'd be I'd be going back and asking him what exact scan and what do they hope to see in this scan because there's no point in doing it at, at these low levels okay you know this is this is John I got I have a very similar situation Peter I'm, yep. uh, this summer I'm going to be coming up on my 24 months of ADT. Um, my original plan was 24 months on ADT, although I'm starting to pop tiny levels of PSA now, so it may not be relevant. But it was get it, it was considered that maybe I would go off in the summer, and they scheduled me for a polarifice again this summer. And I asked, I was talking to the nurse practitioner and I said, what for? And she says, Dr. Petrolek always gets a scan before he takes people oh, yes. off discovers. treatment. And my PSA is is really yeah. tiny, like 0.02. So this is the same mystery. Yeah, he's, there was no talk of my taking any kind of drug holiday prior to the scan. We just talked, when I saw him, we were talking about that my prostate cancer is the type that didn't generate 
high PSAs and yet um, run around quite a bit. Uh, so is he thinking that? I don't know. I probably should just ask him what's the point of this scan. Right. I think yeah, that's for, a good question. For whatever it's worth, when I got off, um, Shmulewicz said, just watch your PSA. And I get my I check my PSA every 30 days. Is that the PSA starts to rise, get a polarified test. But if not, he said, just sit back and relax and and uh and we'll watch the PSA and if P and uh don't you know no reason to get a scan now if your PSA is undetectable. That's from Schmulowitz. Schmulowitz. And he's highly regarded, right? Yep. All right, I'll Can have you to guys talk. clarify is there any relationship between PSA, the production of, of the protein PSA? and the PSMA site on our cancer cells. Are the two completely unrelated or, yes. or are they related? They're unrelated. So they're, well, they're there's separate. A they're, uh, there's they're a different. correlation with advanced prostate cancer that, that tends to produce more PSMA than the lower risk prostate cancer. It produces so, more PSA. Is that what you no, said? No, no. What 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 Len said is that the more aggressive your cancer, um, and the more advanced your cancer, the more PSMA you make. But that is not real. That's what Herb is saying is that's not related to the the level of your PSA. Okay. Because some people make very little PSA, but if it's an adenocarcinoma, it's and it makes PSMA, it's going to make more PSMA the more advanced the cancer is. Is that is that right, Len? Yes. Yeah, that's my understanding. So should I be getting a PSMA scan anytime soon, or is that the that's next? That's what we're talking thing? about, Peter. Yeah. I sh we're talking. We're talking about axiomin or PSMA. Yes. Okay. Either well, one. I'm, I'm saying that's correct. Uh, he's ordering that. I think he said axiomin. Okay. Axiomin makes sense actually because it is a, what they call a metabolic scan. So it's a synthetic amino acid that will be picked up by uh, rapidly growing prostate cancer cells that may not be producing PSA. Yeah, I mean, the big problem is that, that that we don't seem to think that you get much of a result on an axiomin scan if your PSA is less than about 0.85 for normal people, for people right. that who produce normal levels of PSA. So maybe that's what he's thinking with me because I never produced a lot of PSA. So okay. I think the answer is to clarify with him. Okay, okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we will move on. Uh, Steve Nordstrom, tell us what's yeah. up. Hey, uh, thanks. I have a quick question about the side effect of prednisone while being on Zytiga. I started Zytiga with prednisone in November of last year. And then in March of this year, I slipped on some ice, fell and ruptured my quad uh, tendon. And when I went to the uh, orthopedic surgeon, she told me that I need to get off uh, prednisone uh, before, during, and for up to 12 weeks after surgery if possible. And because it helps the healing and also um, it, there is, it, it can uh, weaken tendons and things like that. So I was kind of surprised about that. And anyway, I talked to my oncologist and he felt like it's okay to get off Zytiga for 12 weeks. But my question has to do, have, has anybody else been warned about this effect on tendons with taking five milligrams of prednisone? And um, has anybody else had experience rupturing a quad tendon or anything like that? Anybody? I mean, I have not. not. I mean, I really wonder what an endocrinologist would say rather than an orthopedic surgeon. Just because, to me, 
the reason you're taking that five mg of prednisone is because you're not making any steroids because of the abiraterone. So you're not taking, it's not like you're taking pharmacologic doses of a steroid. You're essentially giving yourself replacement levels. So that's why, I, I mean, I don't know, but I think I would check with an endocrinologist about this okay. rather than a surgeon. That's a great point. As a matter of fact, I'm seeing an endocrinologist in a few weeks, so. I, I'll get, I have, I'll ask, I'll, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I, I have a comment uh, that seems relevant. I, I, I don't know. I had total hip replacement surgery in November, the end of November. Uh, and I am, by the way, on prednisone and uh, Abby. And uh, the surgery went well. They did the anterior method, which I believe cuts, that's the quad, right? Up on the top. The, uh, yep. Anyway, or, I, th I think that the healing process for me, because I've had this surgery before on my, uh, on my other hip a couple of years ago, before I was on uh, Zytiga and Prednisone. And I think the healing process has been delayed or slow. Mm. It just mm. seems to me I'm six months in, and uh, when I started playing golf a couple of weeks ago, um, even though you know, it had been feeling fine, 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 that little extra stress of playing some golf, and suddenly it was a little achy. So I have actually made an appointment with my orthopedic surgeon next week to make sure everything is copacetic, um, because it was, after six months, I don't think I should be feeling anything. Um, mm, and I'm wondering, I wonder if uh, the same question, is it the Zytiga prednisone that's slowing the healing process? Are you on anything else besides Zytiga? Uh, Lupron. Me too. Uh, I suspect the Lupron more than this. I take it personally, but that's not a professional opinion. Look at well, Jamie. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean the Lupron, you know, it's it 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 does such a number on your uh, on your muscle musculature, and if you don't intervene strongly, you're going to lose muscle mass. When you're going through a hip replacement, the last thing you need is muscle wasting in your body. Yeah. So I hope you're you know intervening appropriately, regardless of the state of hip. I certainly am, Jim. I uh, work out every day, thirty I minutes on a stationary bike. I'm talking about Stephen. Oh. Never mind. <laughs> oh yeah, I work out every day. The pro the problem I'm having is you have to have your leg in a straight brace for eight weeks. That was the big uh, problem. Absolutely. It's hard to it's hard to run around the track when you're. Yeah, you 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 should uh, should be lifting. Should be doing. Oh, I, am. I do. Good. Yeah. Good, but you, I think you know. I'm just saying that when you have uh when when you're in a Lupron or and and the Zetiga mm -hmm. doesn't help either. Your testosterone is deprived, and you know appropriately, you're going to be weaker. Even if you try to intervene, you're going to be weaker anyway. It depends on how hard you work, but even if you work hard, you're going to be weaker. So I suspect that your your uh, your slow healing is more due to that than the prednisone. But that's just a hunch. So I I, I have a question, Stephen. Did um, did Schmulewitz seem to think that the uh, that the prednisone interferes with the healing process what was his opinion he, i mean he said stop but what was his opinion <laughs> he didn't really say much he just said okay we can do that <laughs> i mean i i've done very well i had sbrt to the one spot on my spine and um so uh he didn't really argue with me too much uh, or he didn't he said he thought it was okay to do that's all he said okay. and i'm planning to go back on i've got about three more weeks um, it's just that I do work out a lot and I, I, I was, I just wondered about this, this weakened tendon muscle. I, I mean, weakened tendon, really, I can't afford to bust any more tendons because hmm. it's really hard to work out when that happens. So I agree. Well, you oh. know, the hip replacement is pretty Im imperfect, uh, medicine. And I've had a week so as since my hip replacement in 2015. I have to really work hard for the psoas muscle, which is the front of the hip, for it to not get inflamed and keep me from sprinting and doing sort of things I like. And uh, it takes so much attention 
And I had a second opinion, an orthopedist who said, you didn't do it right. It's a little bit crooked, and that's why you're having these problems. But I don't know if that's accurate or not. But we know that the chip in the bottle operation that the total hip replacement is, is highly successful for walking around. But we are a generation, you know, these, all these boomers getting hip replacements. It used to be just for geriatric people who wanted to walk around again. Now, older athletes are getting them, and we're, we're asking a lot of the uh, hip replacement, which I think is fine. But it's a different profile, and the data has got to be, you know, very poor on on this because there's just it's just a relatively modern thing that this many older athletes are getting hip replacements so they can cohort, so to speak. So look, guys, it is now ten, but we are halfway through the number of people who want the time tonight. Okay, I'll I'll stay as long as it takes. And I'll Herb, stay. So. I don't have a problem. Right. Uh, but if uh, if we if we want to stay, obviously the more people who stay, the better off we all are. So right. let's just keep going as as long as we can. Yeah. But, well, let me ask: Is there somebody who wanted time who really wants who's more who really feels that they need some feedback and hasn't well, been? I, I, I don't think we can ask that question, Herb. That's not fair. Okay. Um, I think I think what we can do is we we will we will stay here, go through the list, and people can hang in. It'd be great. And and if they can't hang in, but if you're here and you are on the list, we'll get to you. Okay. Yeah, well, I don't really have anything, so you can you can uh, skip me if you if we press for time. <laughs> well, let's. Just, I'm going to go down here. the list. You're here. We are on the list. I'm going to go down the list. Okay, Frank, tell us what's up. Okay, I'll, I'll try and make mine quick. Uh, I have a six six week checkup tomorrow. Uh, blood draw, uh, PSA, and uh, testosterone, and all the rest of the tests. Um, my uh, doc shortened the checkup because he took me off enzalutamide six weeks ago. I'm still on Orgovix, but I was having dizziness. Uh, I had a couple falls. Uh, I had um, uh, the uh, unsteadiness, and uh, he wanted to see if it was uh, the enzalutamide. And since then, in the last six weeks, I've had no dizziness, no unsteadiness, no falls. So he was going to use that, if it turned out that way, to go back to the uh, VA to see if he could get approval for darolutamide. Uh, in the meantime, I'd applied for darolutamide. Uh, I sent it directly to Bayer. And that was like mm, six weeks, eight weeks ago, and I hadn't heard anything, and I figured nothing else was going to happen with it. But I got a letter two days ago, and Bear approved me to receive darolutamide until the end of the year at no cost. So uh, I'm going to be most likely after my discussion uh, tomorrow, I'll be going on darolutamide along with my Orgovix. And I'm certain that uh, they'll go back to the VA and try to get the VA to cover the cost of the new prescription. Um, so so anyway, uh, tomorrow it'll be interesting to see what comes out and um, being off of the enzalutamide for six weeks. So, so Frank, let me just refresh. Your your condition is metastatic castrate sensitive or castrate resistant? Uh, castrate sensitive, from okay. from my understanding. Okay, got it. So darolutamide is approved. For that. Yes. Yeah, I, I uh, again uh, from the uh, letter from Bear. And from my uh, talking with my GU oncologist, uh, he felt that 
darolutamide would be the better option for me because of my uh, side effects. Right. Well, I've got to hope I can pull that off too at some point. Yeah, well, I'll get it from Bayer. And now the question is, can they use the information to get the VA to approve it and get them off the spot that they're on? Right. Um, uh, one other quick thing is uh, I've been a part of the Orgovix Ambassador Program. And Gail and I, my wife, is part of the uh, Caregiver Ambassador Program. And we had uh, and we had our uh, first presentation uh, this morning at nine o'clock to to a Zoom call to Pfizer. Uh, they saw our, they saw our joint life stories, and they wanted to present it to their team meeting this morning. And there was over three hundred on the meeting, and that went extremely well and was well received uh, with our life story and also uh, the fact that I've been very uh, positive about the Orgovix uh, and, and its, uh, its effect on my prostate cancer. Good. So I have a very important question, Frank. Did you get a plug-in for ANCAN during that, during that uh, with all those people there? No, I can't. I can't talk about it. I can only mention my support group, and I told them specifically my support group is the one that gave me the information on Orgovix, and based upon that, I brought that information back to my GU oncologist. Okay. But they have, as as a few will tell you, that have been involved in it or interviewed for it is they will let you say certain things and not let you say certain things mm -hmm. and um and i can't talk about specific specific names i can't talk about the hospital that takes care of me i can't talk about what okay. uh, i got it i got it yeah. i got it but, it, but anyway it. and uh, as a quick answer rick i i will be uh I will be sending that plug in for uh, uh, that you asked me to do. Yeah, okay, thanks, thank, thank, thank you. Great. No, yeah, because great. she's she's the one that did my genetic testing, okay. right. and right. 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 she was a right. she was a good lady, and right. I appreciate we can talk the work about that. that Let's talk did. about that offline, Frank, because we got to keep moving here. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's it, that's it, and I'll I'll get a, a quick email out to. Uh, Rick, uh, after my test tomorrow. Okay, Fantastic. great. Okay, Steve Saft, t tell us what's up. Yes, sir. I'm he here, hanging in there. Uh, um, so I uh, was able to get uh, a treatment of the combination therapy with uh, lutetium uh, 177 I and T and actinium 225 last thursday and uh i am uh, pleased to report that uh, i have no side effects uh and i'm feeling pretty good four or five days well four days later and uh i'm scheduled to go up to new york i need to go up to new york every week but i'll go up thursday and i will get a spec scan, a whole body bone scan, and a whole bunch of other labs. And uh, it'll be interesting to see if, if anything happened. Um, they basically, they told me that uh, the first treatment, it's a two treatment program. I'll get a second treatment eight weeks from now. They said the first treatment is the most important and, uh, I, you know, I, I, I feel pretty good. I, I don't really want to say too much about it for fear I'll jinx it. Um, as, as my grandmother used to say, no Ken <laughs> um, And, uh, you know, there's, I really just thought it's interesting to report to the group that, uh, uh, 
you know, uh, where I guess some people have had a bad experience with actinium, particularly uh, Bryce Olson, uh, that my experience uh, through four days was quite good. So where are you sleeping? Uh, I'm down the hall. <laughs> uh, I'm using my own bathroom. My son happens to be here this week. Uh, when he's moving out to Denver. Uh, and, you know, we're just keeping separate. I think by tomorrow, um, you know, there are some of the restrictions are off. One interesting thing that I learned is in New York City, all the New York NYPD police officers carry some sort of a um, scanner. And that if I got within six feet of a New York City police officer, they probably well, they said they would stop me, and and if I got stopped in a traffic stop in the city, and that uh, I had to show them a letter, uh, which I thought was just amazing, the whole idea that I was so radioactive that I would set off, uh, you know, a dirty bomber alert in, uh, <laughs> in New York City, uh, which they said actually was mostly from the lutetium, not from the actinium. Um, and uh, so... Uh, you know, obviously, so Steve, we, yes, I, I have a, a theory. I mean, the fact that you're having no side effects is terrific. And a while back, it was suggested that if they gave you a treatment um, with the large molecules, which is the actinium, that that could block up the cells in your esophagus and um, it would not be impacted in the same way when you got the small molecule, which I think is the is the loop is the lutetium. Which did they give you first, the actinium or the lutetium? Actinium. Right. So I'm wondering if this is actually this theory that we've we've talked about before, you know, with large and small molecules, and the, the large molecules um, reduce the side effects if they give if it's given first. I, it, I if, I'll try. I mean, I'll maybe I'll you could email me the theory, and I could ask them when I go Thursday, or I could send an email to the nuclear medicine department. Uh, there were four people attending to me with a Geiger counter and, you know, one person putting it in. I, I thought, really, you know, they're telling me how radioactive I am, and they were all standing in the same room with me throughout most of the treatment. Boy, they, they must have been standing behind a barrier. No, they were not. And uh, huh. they all had, you know, monitors on them, and uh, they said, don't worry about it. They, they had it under control. They were experienced. Uh -huh. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, it was really a, a, a very good experience. They are, they're very optimistic um, and they were sharing success stories from other patients that have taken it and they really feel pretty confident um, that there's, you know, that this will, the way that my cancer and the scans and all the diagnostics that I have done over the last 60 days uh, or maybe a little bit more than that, uh, my cancer is set up nicely to respond mm -hmm. to this uh, combination treatment. And, uh, you know, time will tell. I, you know, we'll see what happens, and I certainly will report everything in uh, to, to the group. And uh, like I said, you know, it's uh, it's something that's very interesting, particularly in light of the problems that everybody's or that Plu, uh, Novartis is having with Pluvicto, uh, that maybe some of these clinical trials and or other treatments or things or something that, you know, some people should look, at, look into if it takes too long to get Pluvicto back online. Um, and I'd be more than happy to ask any questions anybody would like me to of the team at Weill Cornell for this particular clinical trial or others. Well, I mean, I, I think the question to ask is, are they still taking 
patients and if they are how many do they need because we you know we've got people i suspect that anybody that started treatment is not going to be eligible but if people haven't started treatment and they're looking then we, we you know we'll we, we can start uh, yeah, yeah. directing them towards alpha plus beta i will i you know i'll i'll see them i'll be there thursday and uh i think i may even see dr tagawa um on thursday but regardless uh they're the two uh nurse practitioners that are administering this uh angela and amy you know i can ask them and or any questions of uh the, the person that was in charge of the nuclear medicine department that was attending to me i'd be happy to do that if anybody would like me to uh rick or well, any of the other participants no, I, we, we'd like you to find out yeah. whether they're recruiting yeah we okay would. all right i'll 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 ask them in person on uh, thursday thanks and, and report right. back and report right. back for sure we'll see you next tuesday <laughs> yes indeed yes indeed so uh, you know i'm i mean after such a big disappointment a month ago I, you know, I, I, I'm very pleased to be able to report that I had it, and so far, it seems to be working well. And even the fact that I have enough stamina to make it to 10:15 is probably a good sign. Like I said, I don't know. Really, <laughs> exactly. Right. right. <laughs> Thank you. Right. <laughs> so, all right, um, that's my report, and. Uh, you know, we'll keep following up as I learn things. I'll share them with everybody. Great. So uh, let's move on. And Joel, tell us what's happening. Yes, thank you. Uh, going back to January of this year, um, my PSA was 3.6 as a baseline before my five treatments of SVRT that ended on 7 February. Since then, a PSA went up to 3.7, then to 4.1, and now in May it has a, a, a gone down to 3. Point, back to 3.6, which is a relief to the doctors and myself because it's finally turning around. Uh, the fact that uh, Anton Arrakis and um, Dr. Eblen, my radiation oncologist, had collaborated, and they had decided for my PSA went above four. They would give me another PSMA, and I did take a PSMA a couple of weeks back. Uh, found no new cancer any place from head to toe except for my right occipital condyle bone, uh, where the cancer had already been radiated. It was still very active with an SUV max of 11.4 uh, up from 11.1 back in August. Mm -hmm. Uh, which, uh, again, I'm glad Rick said uh, uh, two weeks ago that uh, PSA um, really uh, spikes up. The uh, uh, body makes more PSA or the can uh, cancer makes more PSA when uh, it's radiated for a short while. Uh, Dr. Um, um, Kistler at the Metro Region Pet Center, who gave me the PSMA, uh, said, I don't expect it to get uh, much uh, of a, uh, a clear indication until July or August because it'll take that length of time for the cancer to die off. So anyway, that's my situation. Uh, it's headed in the right direction, and I'm just hoping for the best. Yep, good. Any questions yeah. for Joel? Yeah, that's 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 great, Joel, that, it, that you have turned the corner and it seems to be heading down and um what 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 was the difference in the size on the occipital legion between this PSMA and the last PSMA well the size is hard to say because as you know the PSMA is just a big ball of light basically where the cancer is yeah. and uh, unless you take an MRI of the exact same spot you probably can't take a measurement uh, very easily uh, other than okay. the SUV Max, which I just relayed to you. Um, so um, that's all I uh, can say. I didn't ask that specific question, but uh, but the SUV Max was slightly greater. Uh, but all that does, according to Anton Arrakis, is prove that uh, you did have prostate cancer there, but we already knew that. Right, right, right. Okay. 
Well, we'll be e eager to hear how things go. Right, my next BSA is in June, yep. Okay, good. Eric, so what's up? Thanks for waiting. Yeah, yeah um, um, just got a quick question. So um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I went uh, to see my um, oncologist uh, and my PSA, well, is continue to go down is down to um, three. And uh, my question is that because when I asked her, I was like, well, you know, do you I was like, what do you expect? Do you expect, you know, my PSA to get to zero? And she said, you know, probably not. So my um, question is, you know, so what what should I expect? Should it get to a certain number and then start to increase again or you know, I'm just trying to d determine like what I should expect because it probably will go down a little lower because they said it, it should take about two years. But I just wanted to see what everybody else's opinion is as to uh, about this. I mean, I think what you can hear, Eric, from all the others is we there's no expectations here. Okay. It's sort of like we're hoping that it goes down and you're being treated in a way that it should go down. Uh, some people go down to zero, other people do not. Some people fluctuate, others do not. I think it's a very hard question to answer. Rick, do you have any insight? So um, what, what treatment, I mean, I know you had the brachy and then um, you're on, are you on Orgovix right now? No, so I'm not on anything right now. So not after- anything. Yeah, so after the um, organs, I did have uh, the pelvic region, radiation through the pelvic region. Right. And, and um, that's the last thing I had. And so, you know, um, uh, Dr. Marshall was like, you know, you know we're not going to um, do any medicine or anything right now. She did say if it starts to go up, we'll do another scan to see where the, where the disease is. Uh, but other than that, that was all I had from from her and and how often uh, are you well, checking it say that again how often are you checking your psa about every three about every three months um i i'll check it again next month because i i see the radio radiology oncologist for my six month uh visit right and and when they scanned you, when Dr. Andy Marshall scanned you last, did they see anything or not? I didn't. I haven't received. I haven't had a scan since the radiation. Okay. Um, so are they planning on scanning you to see whether they see anything or not? Um, it doesn't sound. It doesn't sound like it. Um. I'll see what the uh, radiation oncologist is going to do for that visit, but it doesn't seem like, because she said that if it starts to go back up, then they'll do another scan to see where it is. Right, right. Well, you know, the problem, the, 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 the problem when you have this sort of treatment is that you can have healthy prostate tissue left, and the healthy prostate tissue can be making PSA. Okay. Now, 3.0, a level of three is still quite a high level. Hard mm -hmm. to know just just how far down it will go. I mean, I think they'd like to see it go down a little lower. I mean, I know in my own case, um, after I came off the Lupron and I was on Lupron for a lot longer than, than you were, it rose to a level of about one, and then it declined from there. But, um, you know, as, as, as Herb said, everybody's different. I mean, just keep coming back to us, keep watching it, you know, don't go longer than three months is what I would say. Mm -hmm. And um, hopefully it's gonna continue to go down. But I mean, I do think that um, before it gets to a level of one, if it keeps going down, I, I would want a scan. I'd like to know what they're seeing. I mean, I don't think there's any harm in doing a PSMA scan. Um, and if that PSMA scan shows nothing there, 
then great. If it shows something there, then you know you get a you get a jump on it. I, I don't know. I'd just be watching it. I think if it were me, I'd be saying, Dr. Marshall, I, I kind of like a PSMA scan. Okay. Yeah. I think so. I mean, I think what the idea that you're not, I guess I'm not sure why they're not treating you with anything right now. Well, that, that, that was the treatment. That was the original um, treatment program. Mm. You know, the, 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 the original treatment program was, um, was Orgovix and, 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 um, and breaky, well, I guess you did the breaky back in July and the PSA never really went down. There was some sort of a recurrence. It went up to nine. Mm -hmm. You started the, how, how long did you do that Orgovix for, um, Eric? Three months. Three months. And then, and then mm -hmm. you, and you had the 28 sessions of the, uh, ra radiation therapy with that. Yes. You know, I mean that that that's the that's the program hub when you're okay. three plus four, right? And so now they're waiting to see where it's going. But I, you know, I can I get the program, but I think if I were advocating for myself here, I would be saying, you know, I'd really like to know if you're seeing anything since my PSA is high enough to show, and I okay. get an Axiomin scan or a PSMA scan. Okay. Because before I, before I had the actual second round of radiation treatment, um, I had all those scans, and they said, you know, you know, because of my um, break, because of the seed therapy I had, they really couldn't, they really couldn't see anything because they didn't know if it was like, you know, I guess from the um, previous radiation. But the, I guess this is a different scan. A PM, PSMA scan will be a little different. Well, yeah, because the PSMA scans looking at all across your body and seeing is the is this coming from anywhere other than the prostate, which is what you want to know. Right. Okay. And if it is, then we can start working on that and get an early jump on it. If it isn't, then it's it's related to the healthy tissue that's still remaining around the prostate, mm -hmm. and um, and we want to. Uh, treat it but I, I I don't see just sitting on your hands here given the history given that there was a recurrence given that the PSA has not come down and and it, it might continue to come down but you know what what's the harm in doing a PSMA scan what's the downside that that would be my question okay all right that is it for tonight unless there's somebody who, I mean, Jim Barnes, you joined late. Would you like to say anything? Oh, yeah. If you guys are giving me the opportunity, I was having computer problems earlier and I couldn't get on on time. I, you know, I just had a bone scan and a CT scan. A CT scan came back with uh, one thing I want to mention, you guys. It came back with an enlarged, uh, you know, you know, observation of an enlarged prostate. And here I am, yeah, I, I had SBRT and my, all my prostate, had it treated and everything. I'm just sitting here wondering, how the heck did I have a large prostate after I had it radiated? And I was just wondering if anybody have heard of such a thing. Uh, no, but I don't, I don't know that I have, I don't know that I have that much experience. I would have thought it would have shrunk, but I don't know, yeah. I mean, They didn't say it was enlarged when you were first diagnosed? Of course. Okay. Yeah, it was, that was, uh, of course, that was part of the uh, diagnosis. It was, it was, it was uh, significantly large, not as some of the uh, extraordinary stories I've heard here, but um, <clears throat> I forget how many grams or however they, they weighed it or however they measure it. But I was just, um, like I said, I just uh, had that, Diagnosis on the CT scan. I'm going to see my uh, uh, GU oncologist tomorrow morning, so I'll get more insight on it. But I was just wondering if anybody had ever heard of that. Any any thoughts on questions I should be asking my doc and that sort of thing? 
So did they say it's larger than it was at the beginning of and it's actually swollen or increased since diagnosis? Yeah, this is this is my uh, third since I've had treatment. This is my third CT scan with contra with and without contrast and uh, the full bone scan. And um, you know, just the remark was on the uh, CT scan from last Thursday was that it might had an enlarged prostate. So I'm like, wait a minute, I had it treated. How the heck could I have an enlarged prostate? Hmm. So I guess I'll find out more tomorrow. Oh, and I can I can fill you guys in next week. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Jim, the question I have is exactly Peter's. It may be enlarged, but how does it compare in size to the previous scans? And we don't. You're saying we don't really know that. Well, well, they didn't remark on it um, because I didn't think they observed that it was uh, enlarged at all. So the the new co the new comment here on my third and most recent uh, CT scan with contrast is, is that uh, they observed the uh, enlarged prostate. They didn't make that observation prior uh, on any prior scans. Well, I think I would ask, you know, I mean, d different different readers interpret in different ways, and 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 I think the question that um, I'd be asking to um, to your guy, uh, what's his name, Fishman, Waterman, Appleman, yeah, Kappelman, right? Kappelman. Yes. The 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 the, the, uh, the. I think what I'd be Appleman, but I think what I'd be asking Appleman is, um, uh, how does this compare to previous? Sure. You know, I mean, I think. That's the key. Did they see anything else or was everything else cleared? What about the old Mets that were there? Did they see those still? Um, bone scan bone scan didn't show any Mets in my spine, which is good. They did observe some. Um, they, they didn't remark on uh, that they saw, did see cancer in my spine on the CT scan with contrast. Did not show up on the bone scan. Uh, and But what did show up on the uh, bone scan was a um uh a, a spot uh in the uh, pubis ramus or whatever that is down way down there in the hip bone okay and that uh, um you know the dad had that metastasize or that that cancer had grown so, uh somewhat i don't know how much okay. but they just said there was an uptick so so let me just clarify so that you're saying on the bone scan they saw this in the pubis pubis ramus um, and that might have grown a little bit on the CT scan. They didn't remark on anything. Just that they had seen the. Um, I think I think in that with that respect of that spot on the pubis ramus is that the uh, they saw it on both the bone scan and the CT scan. Okay. Just from my just from my rem, uh, memory. But 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 they didn't see any spinal mets anymore not a, not on the bone scan on the ct scan with contrast they said they did remark on uh the fact they did see cancer in my spine but it didn't show up in a bone scan which is good I, I, well I, then in that I case i think what you've got to find out is are they bigger or are they smaller that's what you've got to drill down on because those uh -huh. have been there for a while so you know um, just what you want to know is what's there that wasn't there before or what isn't there that was there before. Of course. Right. Yeah. Changes are critically important. Okay. Especially if they're getting bigger. <laughs> okay. I, so I'm the, curious. We, we want to talk to Karen Grant. Right. Karen, on let, me, let me introduce Karen. She just sent me uh, a text that it's okay. really her husband has been diagnosed with prostate cancer and according to his doctor he supposedly has two years to live so i already mentioned to karen that i thought that that was a bit suspicious that this can be treated as a chronic disease so please karen tell us some more well i really appreciate you um letting me pipe in here i don't want to take away from anybody else who is um needs to talk about what's going on in their lives so i'd like to start with that hey, you're you're the last we're going to close after you so we are fine oh, okay. 
All right, so I'm the end of the parade. Um, he had he was diagnosed with cancer in, in 2017, and he has had radiation. And he's the one that knows all of this, and he can talk just like you, the the rest of the group here. He he's got the lingo, and um, so he is um, androgen. The the hormone treatments aren't working any longer. Um, he is on Lupron and he is going to be starting on the Dalitaron or something that was mentioned tonight. He was given a free month of that. So um, he's going to try to get started on that soon. By the way, for everybody who doesn't know, he's camping in Southern Utah right now. Um, and I, I found you guys. Um, so, I mean, I think Karen, is there any chance he can join us next week? You have it every week? We meet every week, every other, but on on Monday, it's, it's at 8 p.m. On and, But every other week, it's on Tuesday at 6 p.m. You're at this time, so it's 3 p.m. your time. You're in Seattle. Okay, so you meet before the caregivers group on Tuesday as, every, or no, yeah. every other week, you said. So, okay, yeah. Monday we, at 8. We meet. On Tuesdays, we meet before the caregivers group. You're absolutely right. Um, no, wait a minute. That's wrong. Sorry, no. They, they I'm meet. wrong, I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Because the caregivers group are meeting tomorrow. Uh, no, on Tuesdays, we meet before the MS group. Sorry. First and third. I'm getting myself confused. 12 to okay second and fourth okay um he will not be back in town um but um uh I let, let, let us ask you a couple of quick questions here karen you're in you're in the seattle in the northwest in the seattle area is that right yes and he's and, where, been, and, and what sort of doctor is treating him right now the good kind the one you got that you talk about on a regular basis do you um, know the name of his doc it's yeah, who's Todd Yajewski, something like that. He's um through connected to cancer, Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. Care Alliance. Okay. So That's not an, I mean, we know a few of the docs at Cancer Care at Seattle um Cancer Care. Um but other I, doctors, but um I don't remember their names. I mean, it, it doesn't sound to me. I don't think a doc at Seattle Cancer Care, a, G, a Janito urinary medical oncologist, would tell him he had two years. Because well, they, I, they... I'm here to. I should probably explain that. So yeah, um, okay. Brett and I are are trying to figure out how to plan our our future, what to do. Right. And right. um, so we wanted to have a. We asked him to give us a better idea of of how long he might expect to be um, pain-free or functional um, uh, so we could go about living more of a regular kind of life. And that's that's what he came up with. His um, PSA is rising very quickly. And um, Has he had chemotherapy? He has not had chemotherapy. Okay. He did not have surgery. He had radiation. Okay, so let me just say that this is all too early, and 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 there's so much that can be done, and we can nail this disease and pull it right back right now. But but we he's got to have the right information. I do, how do you spell the name of that doc that he supposedly that he's seeing? It's a it's a challenging one. Um, I will look it up. Um, yeah. Um, Gosh, I have no brain. I, I was wondering when, about the effects of, of the medication that you take for prostate cancer on cognitive development, but it's um, it affects me as much as it affects him. Sure. Well, All sure. So, um, is, he is he metastatic? Does he have it in his bones? He doesn't have it in his bones, but um, from the very beginning, they saw that it was in a uh, lit up in a, a lymph node by, okay. his, mm -hmm. by his hip. Um, some of us are like that. I've been going eight years with just lymph node involvement, and, uh, and uh, so there's a lot of things that can be done. Don't don't get panicky about this. 
Well, so should I let him spend all of his money now in the next couple of years? No, or do no, no. 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 He's got to connect and talk. He's got to. He's got to get on here and talk to us. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, he needs to join our group and learn that this well, is treatable. Yes, he he um, liked a lot of what um, that I told him about because I've been watching your recordings and then he also um, listened to some of yours too. Um, the one with, um, well, I can't remember. It's the uh, May 20th, I think. Um, I'm sorry. How old I'm, is he? He is um, 66, 66. Okay. Can, will he will he be more ex acceptable, more like a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone instead of a whole group? Good question. I don't think so. I think he's he'd be fine because especially because you guys talk about medical stuff and uh, I, and just our experience and stuff. You know, when I when I just first you know I first got diagnosed, you know, I thought it was doomsday, and you know. My doctor said I had, you know, five to 15 years, you know, I'm making videos for my kids and try to think and coming to this group it helped me relax a little, you know, I'm still a little anxious, but it helped me, you know, I'm human, but it helped me relax a little and it gave me a chance to get some clarity and think and ask, you know, get some information to ask the right questions and to, to talk to people, you know, that's on this, that's been, been living this for years. Right. Yeah. So, well, we were, we were hoping that he would be one of the people who died of something else. And I have heard from many of you that that's exactly what the situation is for many of you. Um, this is what we all hope for. Right. Right. I mean, the problem yeah. is, I mean, as someone will put it, we are all living a terminal disease. The, right. None of us was going to get out of this life alive. Right. And so this is just something else we have to deal with. That's you know, the right. reason the reason that we don't like doctors putting a timestamp on our survival or our or time to being dying from disease, you know, in the process of dying or any of that is because it's the kind of disease, as as these guys will tell you that know more than me, that the same stage, the same disease uh, looks like the same on paper. And everything in, in in different men is completely different, and in how it plays out, it is so heterogeneous that, that there's no way that we that it can know. And it's very important that they, that they, when they put a stamp on it like that, it makes it seem that you can look at the pathology and you can look at the disease state in a man and say, okay, this is where it's going to go in X amount of time. But the one thing that I've learned is that is not true. Can you guys can back me up on that? I'm sure. <laughs> so. So Karen, so I, he's never had chemo. No, no, he would he would be able to tell you uh, if that was something that was so, discussed. So I think we, you know, we need to talk to him. Oh, soon. absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Um, you should be, you should be on too. Yeah, both of you should be on. Yeah, you can both join, right? Uh, well, yeah. I've been. Um, I came today. <laughs> mm -hmm. I I didn't know if that was okay though, because I I don't know if this would be less comfortable if a woman was in the um, group as well. So. It's not the first time. Karen, <laughs> we want <Why> women. <laughs> there, there's more than one set of there's more than one set of husband and wives that hang out both together at the same time. That's well, right. I've heard a couple of wives. <laughs> I have the name of Dr. Zuzewski, and I've been trying to put it in the, the chat, but... Uh, Sp spell it out for us. It's Y-E-Z-E-F-S-K-I. Zuzewski. Yeah, it's not, a, um, it's not somebody I know. We got a bunch of guys who are busy checking him out right now as we speak. <laughs> You know, I know that, um, you know, that the docs that we know there that are really good, um, uh, Heather, um, Heather Chang is one, um, uh, Schweitzer, 
Mike Schweitzer is another. Evan Yu is another. Um, there's there's a couple of others, but those are the three off the top of my head that 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 if you told me one of those, I would say, oh yeah, you know, he's he's in good hands. But I don't know Yazevsky. Is it anybody find him? Did you find yes, him? Yes, exactly. I did. I, I found him. Area Ooh. of practice GU. I am board okay. certified and specializes in GU, which includes blah blah blah. Okay. He's a handsome, kindly looking guy. I'm talking to the guys. Yeah, he's a, I can call you back. Assistant professor, so he's relatively young. Yeah, he is young. And I, I in his defense, he did not give it the two years as um, a life expectancy. Oh. That's my interpretation of it. And um, okay. trying to decide how um, how to live our lives is very important. Uh, I mean, it's it's a, it would be very helpful if we had a better idea of how much money we can spend in the next couple of years. He could be around for a very long time. I don't know yes. if that's good or bad news, Karen. You know, <laughs> but but he, could be for a long time. <laughs> he wants he wants to spend all of his money. So. Don't blow through the money. Do not blow through the money. <laughs> Don't spend it so fast. She could be around a long time. That's you don't right. want that. Yeah, and, and Yasevsky <laughs> writes papers. He's on papers with you and he's he's publishing. Okay. So that's no, encouraging. I mean, yeah, I mean you, you, and I'm sure that, that that they'll set him straight and we'll give him the questions to be asking these docs. <laughs> but um, you know, God bless. But don't him. spend your don't spend all your money. Yeah, this, don't spend your last. Yeah, you'll be dead broke years before he's dead. Well, that's what I'm afraid of. So I'm the cautious one. So I have another question. Um, tell me if you just want to go or if you're ready to go. But um, Brett is a manly man who is just an amazing person, and he. When he started taking these hormones, he's he's changed. The doctor said he wouldn't change, but I I think it changed how he walked through the world. Sure. Okay. I just want to that's get what, Karen. That's what my wife says too. So I don't yeah, think I it's think an unusual situation. That, as far as me, I had I had to take um, Orgovix hormone therapy, and it just completely changed everything. Uh huh. So you're a little more sentimental. Um, yes. More yes. Yeah. I mean, it's a good thing. <laughs> yes. It's a good good. Thing. It's like, you know, I, I'm used to this manly man who's in control, and um, he's still that way. But, um, but unfortunately, the problem is when you have this disease, you feel like you've lost some control of your life. Right? And that's I mean, this is all. I mean, this is not. This is very typical. Yeah. But, you and know, it's, it's we all thought we, you know, here I was a marathon runner and thought I could, you know, would be really great for the rest of my life. And then bang, this happened. And so it changed everything. Right. Yeah. Both of his parents were in the 90s and, you know, he's 60, 65, 66. How old he? He can And he might be able to get there. Living life without testosterone, when you're a man, living life without testosterone is very different. Yeah. There's, there's the good news is we don't, nobody stays on it real long, at least most of us don't. And yeah. after two years, you take a holiday and, but life is different. Life has changed and, and, but there's still so much to be grateful for in this beautiful yeah. world. There is. And that is something that's expressed a lot more since he's been on ADT. Um, Excellent. Yeah. There's, so. there's another couple from Seattle who were on a couple of weeks ago. He's been on before. Who were dealing with this, and she she helped. She was willing to help uh, talk to uh, the wife of a friend of mine here on Maui uh, a couple of weeks ago about mm -hmm. effects of hormone treatment because he's been on. He's, they've been on for well over a year now, and um, yeah, it affects it affects you, it affects <laughs> in our lives uh, greatly. Hugely, we often ignore that. So, but yeah. uh, talking to another woman, might you know, who's going through the same thing. Well, I'll, we'll see if we can. I'll see if I can track down their names. Maybe Rick, can you remember their names? 
the, the couple they were on together a few weeks ago. Uh, I'm drawing a blank on the on who well, you're talking about, Peter. I'm sure, if necessary, oh, Nancy would be happy. To, my wife would be happy to talk to you. Is she right. the one that has the column where she answers questions? No. No. Oh. No. But we don't, we don't. My wife, Karen, my <laughs> wife, but would reiterate exactly what you said between before I started, which was uh, 42, 41 months ago, uh, and now under treatment, Matt, uh, you had described, uh, you know, I calmed down totally. I was a type A, <laughs> and uh, she just loves it because I'm, yeah, I'm more emotional. Uh, I think we all are with yeah. no testosterone. But well, so we do have a we do change. <laughs> Yeah, and we have a different perspective on life as well. Gary, I wish I was not. I still am a type A. <laughs> <laughs> a little less aggressive, though. <laughs> Unless, uh, Karen, I've been off it and I've been on it. And I'm a sweetheart either way. So, right, me <laughs> too. Yeah, that's how Brett is, too. Brett is a, a well, amazing. He's very lucky to have you, I, I imagine. Mm -hmm. You seem like a very good friend. Uh, excuse me, Karen. Karen, do we have your email address? We do. Yes, we do, Jim. Oh, good. Oh, we do. We do. I don't know. And you'll what? be getting you'll be getting notices now. Okay, great. Yeah. So let, let me say a couple of things here, Karen. The first is that um, we have a really good caregivers group that meets on the first and third. Tuesday, so there'll be a meeting tomorrow in this room at um, five o'clock. Yes. Um, and you're very welcome to join that meeting, although I will just give you a heads up that in that second meeting of the month, we do talk about grief and bereavement. We don't in the first meeting. So okay. I just want to tell okay. you, I just want to give you a heads up, but we have people that join and there are women in there who have lost their spouses and who are very very knowledgeable about well i don't say very knowledgeable but but pretty knowledgeable about prostate cancer and these issues that you're bringing up they will be happy to 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 address so i'd encourage you to think about that and i'll i'll forward you the the reminder for that oh that's um, Thank you, Rick. Um, secondly, you're always welcome into these meetings along with or without Brett. Mm -hmm. So if he comes, you can come, uh, both of you can come. But you know, as you can see, the guys love having caregivers in in, in the care partners in this in this meeting. Mm -hmm. And all you've got to do is reach out if you want some one-on-one -on -one people to talk to, we can connect you. I got to try and figure out who the heck Peter's talking about from a couple of weeks ago because it's not sticking in my mind. The last time Peter did this to me, it turned out it was somebody from a whole different meeting. So <laughs> I, this, this was our this was our meeting. I'm sure of it. I'll find it. I'll, I'll, <laughs> That's what he said to me last time as well. But no, anyway, I know. <laughs> hey guys, I have to go to bed soon. Okay, <laughs> we just drop we off whenever you have to drop off. Her. It's fine. No, I'm leading. I'm the I'm the moderator. I can't drop off. <laughs> you can drop off. We got it. We got it. So so um, but we we will sort you out. And the last thing I want to say is that a man's body without testosterone, as you've heard, changes that person significantly. Yeah. And so what you're seeing in Brett is what. Most of these guys on this call have experienced themselves and their and their partners have experienced in them. There are a few that don't change. And, and one of the reasons is because your brain chemistry relies on testosterone to make all of its various brain proteins. And if the testosterone isn't there, the brain proteins are different. Professor Geller will testify to that because he knows of it, he knows that from a different from, from the researcher perspective. <laughs> Um, 
And that's why so he's, he's experiencing it gosh, too. I'm crying. You know, why am I crying? Why am I getting yeah. emotional? Well, it's because you, you don't have the same checks and balances as you do when you've got testosterone inside you. Okay. So you're not imagining it. Thank you very much. I really appreciate all the support you've given me tonight and all that you've shared about your experiences. It's been very okay. helpful. So look, we'll see you soon. Okay, I'm yeah. Back. Okay, I'm guys. Back. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Good night, Thank all. Good night. Good night. Live life to the fullest. Good luck. Bye. Bye. Bye.